Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. On behalf of Pakistan Society of Hematology, I welcome all my distinguished guests, speakers and viewers to the morning session of uh, HemeCon 2021. Uh, the session for today, uh, this session is about leukemias and myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, we'll be having first three free papers. Uh, it, was, it will be followed by expert talk by our uh, respected speakers from USA and UK. And uh, the panelist for today's session is Dr. Muhammad Ayaz Mir. He is Director, Bone Marrow Transplant, Shifa International Hospital. Dr. Nigat Shehbaz, she is Consultant, Clinical Hematologist and Transplant Physician, National Institute of uh, Bone Marrow Transplant and Dr. Uzma Zaidi, she is Director, Bone Marrow Transplant, NIBD, Karachi. Uh, we'll start with free papers uh, first. The first free paper is by Dr. Neelam Mansoor. She is FCPS Hematology, the Indus Hospital, Karachi. And the topic is Central Nervous System Involvement in Childhood Lymphoblastic Leukemia and Analysis with Reference to Day 1 versus Day 8 Lumbar Puncture in Remission Induction Therapy. I will also like to uh, just uh, add that the questions about this session can be asked by clicking on ask a question virtual environment which is on uh, the login link and our website as well. Secondly, you can uh, all the questions which uh, will be asked will be directed to the moderator WhatsApp. But uh, the requirement is that WhatsApp should be installed on your uh, computer systems on your laptop or, or your desktop. Another, another option is that you can directly send your questions on moderator's WhatsApp number. So we'll start with three paper session. Um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Neelam. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. And we'll be recording to everyone. So my today's talk is about a very important problem that is associated with a very common procedure that is number function. So the title of my study is Central Nervous System Involvement in Childhood Lymphoblastic Leukemia and Analysis with Reference to Day 1 versus Day 8 Number Punctures in Remission Induction Therapy. I have nothing to declare. <coughs> so here is a brief introduction of my study. Uh, the overall uh, uh, survival in childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia approaches to 80 to 85% in developed countries. However, the relapse of the disease in the bone marrow and or central nervous system is still a major cause of treatment failure that accounts around 15 to 20 percent of the cases. And the infiltration of central nervous system by leukemic blood cells can be either de novo, that is, blood cells metastasize the CSF as a result of the natural course of primary disease, or iatrogenic, in which the second, uh, it is secondary to traumatic lumbar puncture, which results in the contamination of CSF with blood cells. The prognostic impact of TLP positive is extensively studied <clears throat> and known to have a negative influence on the overall outcome of the disease. The published data from institute shows that from our institute shows that majority of the ARL cases are high risk at presentation. Around 54% cases in our institute was high risk. <clears throat> this is in contrast to the data of resource rich countries, which shows 13 to 35% of high risk cases at presentation. This significant difference could be due to delay in the recognition and referral of patients, which in turn also leads to unstable clinical presentation. These adverse clinical factors at the time of presentation of disease, along with limited supportive services, are associated with an increased risk of traumatic taps when LPs perform on day one of remission induction therapy. <clears throat> in the present study, traditional monotherapy was given during the first week of the remission induction phase followed by a diagnostic LP on day 8. The rationale was to clinically stabilize the patients and decreasing the white cell count and number of circulating blood cells before performing the first LP to see the impact of this approach on the incidence of TLP positive cases. The data was further compared with the historical cohort of upfront day 1 LP to ascertain the differences in the incidence of TLP positive and with over CNS leukemia. So the objective of the study was to delay the diagnostic LP till day 8 of prednisolone prophase in childhood ARL and analyze its impact on iatrogenic CNS leukemia to find out the frequency of CNS2, 3 and TLP positive cases with this modified approach. 
and comparing them with historical cohort uh, of the one LP. So it was a retrospective study conducted at the pediatric hematology oncology section of the Hedges Hospital from January 2010 to August 2018. <coughs> a total of 1,185 patients were diagnosed with de novo ALL were analyzed. These patients were further classified into two groups. Cohort A, where LP was done at day one, and it consisted of 600 patients diagnosed between January 2010 to May 2015. And cohort B, where LP was done at day eight, and it consisted of 585 patients diagnosed between June 2015 to August 2018. In cohort A, upfront multi agent chemotherapy was given according to COG treatment protocol, and in cohort B, a monotherapy. This is a modified approach where a monotherapy with prednisolone was given for one week with a dose of 60 mg per meter square per day, followed by an LP on day 8 and multi agent chemotherapy based on VFM protocol. In both ALL groups, <clears throat> the CSF samples obtained through LP uh, were examined within two hours of the collection of the total CSF leukocyte count, and cytosine prepared smears were reviewed for the presence of blast cells. <clears throat> Based on the CSF analysis, the status of CNS infiltration with blast cell was classified as CNS1, in which the absence of blast cells, regardless of CSF leukocyte count, is a criteria. In, CSF2, uh, in CNS2, the presence of blast cells with a total leukocyte count of less than 5 per microliter. In CNS3, presence of blast cells with a total CSF leukocyte count of equal to or more than 5 per microliter. While the TRP positive cases were <laughs> classified according to the presence of blast cells with a total CSF leukocyte count of less than 5 per microliter and equal to more than 10 red blood cells per microliter. Data were entered, so, uh, these are all the statistics, I'm not going into the details. <laughs> so the results of the cohort were a total of 1,185 patients with mean age of 7.3 plus minus 4.1 years. Cohort A consists of 600 and cohort B 585 patients. A comparison of the CNS status between these two cohorts is shown in table 1, which I will show in my next slide. And the data demonstrate reduction in TLP positive cases <clears throat> from, uh, from 4.3% in cohort A to 1.7% in cohort B with a very significant P value. However, there was an increase in the incidence of CNS 3 cases in cohort B, that is 8.3%, as compared to cohort A. <clears throat> it was 3%. So the p-value again was significant. Uh, in addition to it, uh, a comparison of CNS status with respect to difference between risk variables in cohort B is also shown. So <clears throat> these are the results of comparison between cohort A and B. Here you can see that uh, in CNS1 and CNS2, although the percentages are same in both cohorts, while in CNS3, the percentage of uh, positive cases were 3% in cohort A, while it was significantly raised in cohort B, that is around 8.3%. And if you talk about TLP positivity, in cohort A, TLP positive rate was 4.3%. That was uh, 26 patients uh, out of 600. While in cohort B, it was 1.7%, and uh, it is significantly reduced. So this is a comparison of CNS status with respect to risk variables. It was performed only in cohort B, and here you can see that uh, the risk variables are age, white cell count, phenotype, and NCA risk groups. In, uh, in age group, we, patient, we divided patients into two groups, less than 10 years and more than 10 years. Uh, and you can see the association was uh, significantly found with the age group that is equal to more than 10 years. With white cell count, uh, again, the cases were divided into two groups, uh, uh, and uh, we did not find any association with hyperlipocytosis. However, it is uh, reported in literature that hyperlipocytosis is associated with <coughs> CNS3 status, but uh, uh, we did not find. And if you talk about immunophenotype, <coughs> a significant proportion of T cell cases were associated with CNS3. <coughs> Similarly, in NCI, there is no high risk patients with more CNS3 status. The overall uh, uh, p-values were not significant, however, some association is observed for, with the uh, age group and uh, T-cell immunophenotype and high-risk group. So in contrast with cohort B, 
1.7 percent, where the uh, rate of uh, TLP positivity was uh, significantly higher. Incidence of TLP positivity was found in cohort A, <clears throat> which is comparable with the incidence found in the international studies. That is reported around 7 to 11 percent, in which LP was performed on day one. The success of this approach is likely due to a decrease in the white cell count and the clearance of blast cells from circulation by day eight of prednisone proteins. We observed a significantly higher incidence of CNS3 in cohort B, 8.3%, which contrasts with cohort A and other published studies that I will show in the next slide. A possible explanation of significant rise in CNS3 in cohort B can be delayed in intrathecal treatment for a weak and inadequate CNS penetration of prednisone monotherapy. However, single hospital based retrospective nature of our data demands further prospective studies with randomization of patients for day one versus day eight LP to verify these results. So this is the comparison of our study with the uh, published literature. And the first study is from St. Jude Children's Research Center. The second study is uh, from BFM trial. And here you can see again that the CNS3 rate was uh, quite high in our cohort B, while it was not that much high in the cohort A when LP was performed at day one. Similarly, in TLP positivity, the rate was uh, around 11% in St. Jude's study. It was 7% with the BFM trial, while in our study, it is significantly reduced with the modified approach. So, in conclusion, although we, well, the modified approach of day 8 LP resulted in reduction of TLP positive cases and found to be more convenient due to relatively stabilized patients, yet findings of higher CNS3 incidence is a serious concern and warrants further evaluation to implement this approach as a standard of care. These are the references I used in my study and for the comparison of the results. And I thank you all, uh, especially my co-investigators and the PSH. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neelam. Uh, the next free paper is by Dr. Hamad. Uh, he is FCPS Medicine and currently doing um, residency in clinical hematology. He'll be presenting his study on outcome of patients with newly diagnosed acute promyelocytic leukemia, a single center experience from National Institute of Bone Marrow Transplant, Rawalpindi, Pakistan. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum and good morning to all. I'm Dr. Hamad, a resident clinical hematology, and I'll be delivering a talk on my study on acute promyelocytic leukemia. Acute promyelocytic leukemia is a unique subtype of leukemia associated with a very high early mortality. This is mostly because of catastrophic complications occurring during induction therapy, including DIC and differentiation syndrome. However, with better supportive care and novel therapies like ETRA and DTU, it has become one of the most curable forms of leukemia. The objective was to study the treatment outcomes of newly diagnosed acute promyelocytic leukemia at, uh, at our center. Uh, it, this was a retrospective uh, single center study approved by the Institutional Review Board. It included patients with newly diagnosed APL from the year 2001 to 2020. Uh, the st study included all newly diagnosed cases of APL aged one year with no upper limit and included both genders. Relapsed cases and those with exposure to chemotherapy or radiotherapy were excluded. Total 58 patients were identified, however, seven were excluded either due to incomplete data or as per exclusion criteria. Of all, 61% were male. Distribution into age groups is as shown. Majority of the patients belong to age group 20 to 40 years. The lowest age was five years and the maximum age was uh, 60 years. Fever was the most common symptom, followed by fatigue and bleeding manifestations. Bleeding most commonly, commonly involved gums, whereas hematuria, epistaxis, and GA bleed were next common symptoms. Clinical examination showed particular rash, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy as the common signs. Obesity was the commonest comorbid, followed by hypertension. Other comorbids included diabetes mellitus, asthma, renal stones, and history of psychosis in one of the patients as well. Now, 45% of the patients belong to SANS high risk group. 35% uh, belong to intermediate, and 19.3% belong to the low risk group of SANS risk classification. The diagnosis of APL was based on typical bone marrow findings of increased blast and promyelocytes with 
strong positive Sudan black B positivity. Majority of the cases showed a hypercellular bone marrow with a hypergranular morphologic subtype. Among molecular tests, abnormal cytogenetics were detected in 11.11%. Fish for translocation 15.17 was positive in 21.4%. And PCR for PML rara fusion transcript was positive in 100% of the cases. The treatment regimes used in our patients included the UK AML12, the LPA Pathema protocol, APML4, and the ATU ATRA protocol. The UK AML12 was used for patients diagnosed between 2001 and 5. It was a purely chemotherapy based regime. Uh, the IDA LPA protocol included ATRA in combination with chemotherapy in induction, consolidation, as well as maintenance therapy, and was the com most commonly used protocol in our patients. Uh, it was employed for all risk groups. The APML4 protocol employed ATO in induction as well as consolidation phases and was mostly used for higher risk patients. Uh, the ATO ATRA protocol was a non chemotherapy based protocol and was used for non high risk patients. Uh, febrile neutropenia was the commonest complication followed by differentiation syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, benign intracular hypertension, transaminitis, azotemia, and hypokalemia. There were two induction deaths, four died during consolidation phase and six patients during maintenance therapy. Induction deaths were due to sepsis and differentiation syndrome. During consolidation, one death was due to fulminant hepatic failure due to acute uh, hepatitis E virus infection, one was due to sepsis, and two were due to disease relapse. During, main, uh, and during maintenance, two patients died due to sepsis and four had relapsed and succumbed to progressive disease. There were seven deaths, deaths during the follow-up period. Now the overall survival at two years was 83% in our study. It was 70% uh, at three years and 66.6% in at five years. The survival by risk group was 90% in the low risk group and 88% in the intermediate risk group, whereas in the high risk group it was 73.9%. The survival by protocol was 100% for APML4 and ATU ATRA, whereas it was 76.4% for IDA and 85.7% for UK AML12. Two year overall survival in ATRA based regime was 92%, whereas it was 85.7% in non ATRA based regimes. Now, this plot shows survival curves of patients completing treatment versus patients who could not complete treatment there is a clear survival benefit in the former group. Uh, next, I will present comparative analysis of outcomes of our study with some regional and international trials. Hematological remission after induction therapy was 86.2% in our study compared with 85% in a Turkish study and 84% from an Indian study of 33 patients. In hematological remission for IDA induction in our study was 75.3% compared with 92% in the original LPA 2005 trial. Hematological remission for APML4 induction was 100% as was in the original study. Hematological remission for ATU ATRA at our center was 100% as was in the original Jemima trial. The early death rate in our study was 3.9% compared with 30% in a stu local study from Karachi, 15% from a Bangladeshi study and 5% in a Turkish study. The early death rate for APML4 protocol in our study was, uh, was zero, there were no deaths compared with 3.2% deaths in APML4 trial. There were no early deaths using ATU ATRA protocol in our study. Now the three year overall survival was 70% in our study, whereas overall survival at 3.5 years was 27% and 65% in two Pakistani studies, and it was 75% from an Indian study. The three year overall survival for IDA protocol was 68% compared with 89% in the original LP2005 trial. Uh, overall survival for APML4 was 100% at 80 months compared with 93% in the original study at 2 years. Event free survival for LPA protocol in our study was 68% uh, at, uh, at 3 years compared with 92% in LPA 2005. 
The 18 months event free survival for APML4 protocol was 100% in our study as was in the original APML4 study. The relapse rate at 3 years was 17% in our study compared with 30% in a local study from Karachi and 27% in a Turkish study. In LPA3 pr protocol, 3 year incidence of relapse was 31% in our study compared with 7% in LPA2005. The inc incidence of relapse in APML4 protocol in our study was 0 compared with 3.5% at 2 years in the original study. I would like to conclude by saying that APL is a highly curable leukemia with improved survival outcomes due to at ATU atra based therapy. However, early mortality remains a challenge. With early diagnosis and initiation of treatment, cure can be achieved in most cases. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Hamad. Uh, the next free paper is by Dr. Shaista Shabir. She is MPhil Hematology, University of Health Sciences, Lahore. She will be presenting her paper on Frequency of MDR gene polymorphism in acute myeloid leukemia patients in tertiary care hospital of Lahore. I'm Dr. Shaista from the uh, MPhil student from the Department of Hematology, University of Health Sciences. Today I'm going to present our research with the title of Frequency of MDR1 gene polymorphism in acute myeloid leukemia patient in tertiary care hospital of Lahore. I have nothing to disclose. The pathogenesis of the pathogenesis of AML is associated with ionizing radiation, medication, certain chemical and genetic factors. Polymorphism of the gene and coding for xenobiotics and drug transporters are potential risk factors for developing AML. One of them is a single nucleotide polymorphism of the multi-drug resistant gene in C3435T. Multidrug resistant gene, also named as ATP binding cassette subfamily B, located on long arm of chromosome 7, containing 29 exons and 28 introns. It is a highly polymorphic gene. More than 50 SNPs have been reported. Among them, C343 SNP is uh, in exon 26 is the most widely studied polymorphism. MDR1 gene encode a P-glycoprotein that function as an ATP-dependent E-flux pump transporting exogenous and endogenous substances from the cells, including carcinogens. The reduced P-glycoprotein expression can cause the accumulation of xenobiotics and toxic compounds in cells, which can predispose affected individuals to some hematological malignancies and other diseases. So the objective of our study was to determine the frequency of MDR gene polymorphism and to compare that frequency between acute myeloid leukemia patient and normal healthy individuals. We included the cases of acute myeloid leukemia new as well as on chemotherapy of any age and gender. While the, no, uh, while the other hematological malignancies and non-hematological malignancies were excluded. Samples were taken from Jena Hospital and Sheikh Zayed Hospital, Lahore. Duration of the study was from January 2019-20 and chi-square tests were used for statistical analysis. 3 ml of the blood samples were collected in EDT evacuators. DNA extraction was done by phenol chloroform method. PCR was done by using the forward and reverse primers. And the amplified PCR product of 244 base pair was obtained. Here is an image of uh, 13 samples of uh, gel electrophoresis. And these lines represent the DNA fragments, which are then compared with 50 base pair letter. And it turned out to be 244 base pair. Next step was restriction fragment length polymorphism. The amplified 244 base pair fragment after digestion with MBOI restriction enzyme gave rise to undigested 244 base pair fragment, indicate the presence of T allele and the appearance of two bands at 172 and 72 base pair represent the C alleles. This is the image of the gel electrophoresis and the sample number 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 11 and 13. Our homozygous variant TT resulted in one fragment of 244 base pair, while the sample number 6 and 10. Uh, our wild type variant CC variant resulted in two fragment of 172 and 72 base pair, while the sample number 1, uh, 9 and 12 it resulted in three fragments of 172, 72 and 244 base pair. It shows the heterozygous variant. 
Results were worth it, uh, further verified by Seger sequences on few random samples. All the continuous variables were expressed as mean plus minus standard deviation. Age of the patient was between 16 to 65 years, while the he, uh, mean hemoglobin was a 9 gram per deciliter, WBC count 22.8, uh, plated count 108.9, and a blast percentage 65. There is a slight increased number of male patient in AML group, which could be due to participation bias. Uh, most of the patient presented with fever, uh, pallor, uh, infections, and bruises, uh, while uh, 14 patient had family history of case, uh, cancer and eight patient had a hemo uh, previous hematological malignancy. On physical examination, uh, splenomegaly was present in 29 patient, hepatomegaly in eight, and lymphadenopathy in six patients. All the subjects in both groups were genotyped for MDR1 polymorphism and the distribution frequencies for SNPs were in agreement with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in each group. The frequency of T allele was higher, that is 79 in AFL cases, while lower in the healthy control, and the frequency of C allele was higher in healthy control, that is 48, as compared to AML cases. While the TT genotype was 62% in AML and CT genotype was 34%, CC was 4%. While in healthy control, the TT genotype was 20%, CT was 64%, and 16% of CC genotype. Uh, genetic models were made to explore the genotypic and phenotypic association. In genotypic model, TT genotype was 16.24% times more prevalent than CC genotype, while in the dominant model, CT plus TT genotype was 5.15% more prevalent than CC, and in the recessive model, TT genotype was 8.28 times more prevalent than CC plus CT genotype. Further subgroup analysis was done, and according to AI scoring system, the best fit model for our data was the recessive model. This is also evident by the p-value in the recessive model. And uh, then the AML patient uh, demographic, hematological, and clinical characteristics stratified by MDR1 uh, polymorphism. Only the lymphadenopathy was uh, uh, statistically significant that was higher in CC and uh, CT group as compared to TT group. Jing Dong Li et al. in 2016 performed a similar study in Chinese population and they also stated that MDR1 C3435 T polymorphism was significantly associated with the risk of developing acute myeloid leukemia. R. Feng et al. in 2016 also stated that ABCB1 C3435T sequence variation may affect susceptibility to acute leukemia. So we concluded that the TT genotype of MDR1 gene polymorphism is more associated with acute myeloid leukemia as compared to healthy controls. However, there are some limitations of our study that need to be acknowledged. As AML is a complex disorder, additional genetic and epigenetic factors should be analyzed. Functional validation of the results needs to be evaluated. We are grateful to our patient who agreed to participate in this study, and we gratefully acknowledge the cooperation of Human Genetics and Molecular Biology Department of University of Health Sciences Lahore for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaista. Our uh one of the invited talk uh, by a very expert speaker. So our speaker uh, is Dr. Saira Ahmed. She is a graduate of Khyber Medical College, Peshawar, and she did her clinical fellowship in stem cell transplant from MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in 2011. She is currently working as associate professor, stem cell transplant department, MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. Uh, she is considered as an expert in lymphomas and leukemias, has more than 50 peer-reviewed publications, and has co-authored hematology chapters in textbooks. We usually seek her advice for different difficult cases, and she is always very forthcoming. So, uh, next speaker, uh, I'll invite Dr. Saira to share her talk, and her talk is on 
targeted therapies and ALL. Thank you so very much for inviting me to speak today, and I'm very impressed by yes, the yeah. um, level of the. Uh, I have no disclosures, um, no conflicts of interest, and I'm employed by MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, I am primarily going to be talking about B A L L, and I will not be focusing on T A L L today. Um, and this is just an overall trend of childhood ALL treated with sequential COG um, therapies over the years. I want to bring attention to this timeline down here, 1960 to 1970. So you see that you know the vast majority of patients attain a remission, um, and over time we have improved overall survival by maintaining that remission. Um, one of the reasons for the change in the way that we have treated childhood ALL and in fact some of the really amazing um, discoveries that have happened were secondary to this man. So this is Jay Freireich. He passed away earlier this week. Um, and he was one of the first uh, cancer um, physicians who put together combination chemotherapy prior to um, him and um, a couple of other folks thought that putting more than one chemotherapy drug together would be too toxic, especially in children. Um, he actually pioneered platelet transfusions prior to um, his discovery that you needed to infuse platelets within um, two days of donation. The way that blood transfusions happened where they used the oldest products first, and children would die bleeding to death with ALL. The um, average survival was about eight weeks from the time of diagnosis. Um, and so because of um, his discovery, he actually uh, talked to his um, superior about platelet transfusions who told him, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. We give platelets in blood. And he actually transfused his own platelets after um, separating them um, with, uh, with one of the very first continuous flow blood cell separators to show that indeed he could stop bleeding with fresh platelets. Um, and so with the advent of combination chemotherapy, you had children going from dying within eight weeks to attaining remission. And over the years, the um, you know holy grail has been how do we get from that amazing CR rate at first remission to a maintained overall survival. Um, adult ALO, it's a different disease. Um, although it has somewhat of the same markers, we know that overall survival and indeed even remission rates are much lower than children. And um, really, you have a 40 to 45% overall survival at five years, even with um, more common um, therapies that are used now. 50% of all ALL is diagnosed in either childhood or AYA. Um, the numbers go down throughout the years. However, it's also you can see um, the overall survival and the cure rate also decreases. So those patients who are out of the AYA time range actually have very poor overall survivals comparatively. When we talk about relapsed adult BAL, it's actually quite dismal. So first um, relapse, you have a salvage rate that can be potentially around 50%, but beyond that, really your overall survival is you know, in the either teens or 20% range with a median overall survival of two to three months. Um, measurable residual disease is one of the things that we now use for ALL um, kind of in all stages of disease. And there are more and more sensitive methodology in order Google to assess um, MRD. And MRD status really does drive prognosis. Um, ideally, you want to get your cited reductive therapy in, have no MRD, and have it stay that way. In reality, you often have measurable residual disease that decreases, um, although it's still present, and then at some point, um, you have disease relapse. And oftentimes, you will have MRD precede relapse by a number of weeks to months. So the reasons for recent success in adult ALL have really been um, kind of two things in the distant last 10 to 15 years, and one of those are TKIs for Philadelphia positive ALL, and the other is the addition of rituximab to chemotherapy for both Burkitt and B ALL. I'm going to primarily focus on some of the newer agents, CD22 monoclonal antibody, inotuzumab, the CD19 bite lenitumumab, and CAR T-cell therapy for ALL. 
So when we talk about inotuzumab, it is anti-CD22 attached to clechemycin. There's internalization of the clechemycin, which actually delivers the killer payload. Both um, blenitumumab and CAR T cells engage the immune system. So one is a bispecific that attaches to CD, and the other is a genetically modified um, autologous T cell um, that that can be 19. And we'll talk first about inotuzumab. So inotuzumab versus chemotherapy has been um, established in relapse refractory ALL. This was an open-label phase three study that was randomized to either inotuzumab or standard dealers choice chemotherapy. Um, and you had to be CD22 positive prior to randomization. You could either be in first salvage or second salvage. You could be pH positive or negative. Um, and they did stratify by duration of first complete remission, which um, remission you were in first or second, um, and then age. And the starting dose of the inotuzumab was 1.8 milligrams per meter square. You had 326 patients, um, and statistically you had a much higher um, CR rate with the inotuzumab compared to standard of care, um, and this also translated into a higher rate of MRT negativity. You had over four times more patients who achieved CR and then proceeded to transplant compared to standard of care. When you talk about overall survival, however, of inotuzumab versus standard of care, that does not really translate into a huge home run. So you do have overall survival, and it's statistically significant, but when you actually look at those numbers of 7.7 .7 versus 6.7 .7 months, you know, what that means to your patients, uh, probably not a lot. Um, again, that maintains in your two-year overall survival. Um, and these are patients who um, ultimately, um, you know, are going to relapse and die of their disease. So then the next thing was, like, how do you make this regimen um, better without significantly increasing toxicity? So inotuzumab was added to many hyper um, and and then if you look at the changes in terms of older adults, if you are less than 60 with hyper-CVAD, which is what um, MD Anderson uses as our standard treatment for ALL, um, you have, you know, not a terrible survival rate. But over 60, um, you really, again, are having only a 20% survival in ALL at five years. And so the addition of inotuzumab plus many hyper actually in older patients, again, that same uh, group of over 60 had a significantly better outcome. Um, and so then the next iteration of this was um, reduced intensity chemotherapy with mini hyper um, plus inotuzumab with or without blinitumumab in newly diagnosed patients. Um, and this was presented at ASH um, just this last year. And so they were newly diagnosed, aged over 60, performance status of zero to three, now, performance status of three over 60, that's a very, um, you know, comor comorbid condition. So that means that they are unable to get out of bed by themselves. They are in bed more than 75% of the time. Um, so these are not very robust patients when we're talking about over age 60 robust uh, the performance status of three. They did have to have function, and the way that this was given was that you gave a um, cycle of the mini um, CVAD plus mini methotrexate cytotherapy. Um, and between these cycles in the intensification phase, you gave inotuzumab. You did give pump maintenance. Um, and then in consolidation, you gave four cycles of blinitumumab, which was then continued in the maintenance phase um, with uh, pump interspersed with the blinitumumab. Um, Ursodile was given for VOD prophylaxis. Um, if you look at the age group, these were patients who were aged between 60 and 81 and age 70, about 41%. Um, again, performance status more than two, about 14%. CNS diagnosis uh, at the time, or CNS disease at the time of diagnosis, a very, very low number. Um, and you did have a 41% who had a TP53 mutation with an overall response rate of 98%, CR rate of 88%, no early deaths. Um, and so, you know, again, this is 
uh, a very active regimen in these patients. So um, this is now out with um, longer follow-up, three-year complete remission, durable complete remission, um, 79% with an overall survival 56%. Again, I want to draw attention down to the bottom of your screen. Your age over 70, not doing so great comparatively, but it's moving the it's moving the mark very slow. So your age over between 60 to 69 is now um, where previously you saw your younger patients between ages 30 and 50 and your age over 70 is now where you saw your 60-year-olds um, doing. Um, in older adults, you see that it's safe. You have MRD negativity in 96%. Longer follow-up is needed to see if you can use low-dose fractionated itumab and blenitumumab without chemotherapy. Um, and that is the current iteration of that study. Lenitumumab, it, again, it's a bispecific T cell engager directed to, uh, against CD19 expressing cancer cells. Um, so lenitumumab has been used in patients who were still MRD positive at the end of chemotherapy, um, and it did result in those patients then achieving MRT negativity going to transplantation. We well know that those patients who go to transplant in an MRD negative state do much better than those who go to a transplant in MRD positive, positive state. So this is just looking at the factors at which um, MRD response was based. Um, and again, those patients who were in CR1 did better than beyond. Um, those patients who are younger did better than those who are older. Um, and this is just the Kaplan-Meier curve again of the same. Um, if you look at the middle B patients in first remission, much better than patients beyond first remission. Um, so this was the TOWER trial looking at blenitumumab versus chemotherapy in relapsed refractory ALL. And so again, this is a dealer's choice in terms of standard of care chemotherapy. You've got induction with blenitumumab. Um, it is fairly arduous in terms of being able to give uh, patients blenitumumab. Um, it's a continuous infusion. They have to be in the hospital. Um, but in this particular trial, um, we see really nice responses with an overall response rate of 44% and a CR rate of 34%. And again, this is a very highly refractory group of patients. And so to be able to get them into CR and potentially get them to transplant is really their only hope of curative um, intent. Um, again, this is just looking at um, the blenitumab versus standard of care, not transplanted. Um, when you look at salvage one versus salvage two, similarly to as we saw before, the earlier the better outcomes, the later you are in your disease and the more relapses you have had, you have, um, uh, blenitumab does not overcome that um, adverse prognostic effect. Um, so this is looking at children in a COG trial. So this was a trial of blena plus dexamethasone um, and, uh, versus chemotherapy. And this was ages 1 to 30 with first relapse B cell ALL that were considered higher in immediate risk, um, including patients with Down syndrome and, and other um, comorbidities. Um, and the primary endpoint was disease-free survival with secondary endpoints of overall survival, MRD negativity, and proceeding to transplant. And you really see some nice curves with the blenitumumab dexamethasone alone, um, in, you know, in this population um, that do well overall. Um, but when they relapse, often need further intensification of treatment. Um, so I'm going to talk about CAR T cell therapy. Um, so currently there are um, three FDA approved um, products in the USA that encompass ALL as well as large B cell lymphoma um, and mantle cell lymphoma. So the um, Kite Gilead uh, product is Axicel. The um, Novartis product, which is used for um, AYA and childhood ALL, is Tisa Gen Lec Lucel. I will get that right one day, um, which is the Novartis product. And then the Juno product, which is Lisocell, um, is not yet FDA approved. The thought process is that it will be approved sometime this year. And then Bruxacell, um, Bruxacaptogene, uh, that is the Tacardis product, which is approved now for mantle cell lymphoma. So the difference between these really is that both uh, Tisa cell and Lisa cell use a 4-1-BB co-stimulatory domain, whereas um, Axa cell uses the CD28 co-stimulatory domain, 
Um, and this difference is what leads to the differences in terms of toxicity. Um, so the Eliana trial was TSA cell in pediatric and young adult A cell ALL. This was um, an open label phase two CD19 autologous product, ages three to 21. Um, they did exclude um, uh, CNS disease. So you use your standard um, lymphodepletion with fludarabine cyclophosphamide and got a single dose of TSA cell and the primary endpoint was overall response. Um, and you had an uh, overall survival of 66% and um, your CR rate was 82%. And this was a very heavily pretreated population. You did have grade three or four CRS in about 49% of patients. And what that meant was you had that same percentage of patients going to the ICU needing multidisciplinary care. Um, but the outcomes um, in this patient population were really stupendous. There are a number of other CAR T-cell products that are now being assessed for both the AYA population and the adult population. Um, this is a CAR T-cell trial that came out of MSK, which is a CD19, CD28 Zeta CAR. Um, and the median age for this particular trial was 44. So you had patients from the age of 23 all the way to the age of 74. Um, and you had a CR rate of 83% and an MRD negative CR rate of 60%. Um, this is, again, differences by tumor burden. So recently we have um, more data that um, the evaluation of tumor burden prior to CAR T-cell therapy is important in determining outcomes. You have a higher rate of CRS and ICANs, and you also have worse prognosis for higher tumor burden. Um, and this, again, was seen in um, this particular trial. In large cell lymphoma, the assessment of tumor burden is uh, total, metabo total metabolic tumor volume based on PET scan. It's easier in ALL to assess tumor burden because you can look at blasts um, in the bone marrow. And this was assessed as blasts more than 5% or less than 5%. Um, and you have much better outcomes the lower your disease burden is. Um, Fred Hutch also has a CD19-4 and BB car in adult ALL. Um, again, very nice outcomes, um, but you know the main question is how long do they last? The next step in terms of CAR T cell therapy is going to be allogeneic CAR T cells. So when you are looking at a autologous product, a lot depends on the fitness of the T cells of the patient, um, the disease burden that they have, and how quickly the disease is going to progress. Oftentimes, when you see these patients who are on these trials, they get leukopheresis, but they never get to infusion of cells because the time period between um, the manufacturing process in the middle does not allow them to actually have um, the cells due to disease progression. So a good proportion of patients die before ever receiving their product. Um, off the shelf products is really where um, we want to be able to proceed, that you see a patient in clinic, you determine their fitness, um, and within a week to 10 days, you're able to give them their product. And UCART is an allogeneic CD19 CAR T cell. It has a 41BB co-stim with a CD3 Zeta um, activation domain. And um, it has um, now been tested in both pediatric and adult BALL. So 20 patients, but um, the median number of prior therapies is four. Um, most of these patients did receive um, prior inotuzumab or prior blina. And in fact, more than half had a prior allogeneic transplant. Um, this particular product needs alentuzumab in order to expand. So um, it is more immunosuppressive than FC alone in terms of the lymphodepletion. However, a very impressive CR rate of 67%, 48% of those being MRD negative. Um, among, among the CRs, you had 71% uh, able to go to allogeneic transplant. And again, with four prior lines of therapy, these are patients who are very heavily pretreated in the ALL population. And this is just a sort of thought of the patients who went forward. Um, this is the CAR-T product from Autolus. Um, which has a, it is an autologous product, but it actually um, is a unique um, uh, hinge, which allows it to, um, uh, 
it basically populates faster. Um, so it expands faster than your average um, CD19 CAR T cell. They actually, in this particular trial, infuse different numbers of cells based on the disease burden. Um, the conditioning was the flu side that we normally use. Um, and in this particular uh, trial, you had 26 patients who registered, 24 were manufactured, and 20 were treated. Between the 26 to 20, there was only one manufacturer failure. Um, the rest of the four, pa the rest of the patients, five patients actually progressed. Um, again, very heavily pretreated. A lot of these patients had had pre-inoblina and allogeneic transplant, um, and they did have multiple extranodal sites. Um, of interest, the CRS was actually no grade three CRS. They did have grade three ICANs in three out of 20 patients, and they used tocilizumab in 35% of patients. Now, if you look at um, our, you know the other CD19 auto products, generally you have a much higher tocilizumab use. Um, and they showed that, again, you know two of the 20 patients died from progressive disease, one died of allogeneic transplant complications, um, and they had a number of infections, and that was most likely secondary to the alum 2 Um, But they did have a number of patients who were in complete remission, MRD negative um, complete remission, um, and have had, you know, with really kind of light follow-up, um, a lot of patients that have stayed in remission. Um, the overall response rate was 84% with an MRD negative CR rate of, again, 84%. Um, so in conclusion, for older patients, there are newer, less intensive regimens that incorporate inotuzumab, PKIs. We do have now blenitumumab and um, inotuzumab that can be used together that have shown prolonged overall survival versus chemotherapy alone in the relapse refractory setting. Um, and there are a subset of patients who are exposed to those two targeted therapies together that will have unique toxicities, namely VOD, um, and that will have to be monitored as we move forward. CD19-directed CAR T-cell therapy can do CRs in 80% of patients with relapsed refractory ALL. Um, they have distinct but usually manageable toxicity. At this point, I would say that most experts agree that you should still proceed to allogeneic transplant if you have someone who is transplantation naive um, and does attain a remission with any of the above um, uh, chemotherapy or um, novel therapy agents. With that, I will finish. I'm happy to take any questions, um, and I'm always happy to hear from anyone. You are more than welcome to email me at any time. Thank you very much indeed for such a fascinating talk. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Serge was Tostic with us. He's professor of medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. He is a global leader in myeloproliferative neoplasms. He has established, he has actually founded uh, the world largest MPN clinical research network. He has authored more than 500 research articles and uh, has published around 23 book chapters as well. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Was Tostic, for sparing your time. Uh, he'll be sharing his talk on current management of myeloproliferative neoplasm. It's a great honor and a pleasure to join you here today. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, share my experience with you. And I learned already a lot from your experience listening to prior speakers. Really a fun and enjoyable event. I hope that uh, my presentations, and I have about 45 minutes to present on management of MPNs, will be useful as well. And I'm looking forward to a quality discussion after that, if we have time. So I'm really going to focus on, on management. We have heard about, uh, and just prior talk about the diagnostic uh, process and the prognostication. Uh, so we're going to talk first about ET, and then we're going to talk about PV, and then myelofibrosis. That's the task for today. And of course, there is less on a PV and ET and there is much more on myelofibrosis just because the myelofibrosis is such a deadly condition and we worry about patient survival and we are trying to save their life basically. That's the reality. So let's talk about the easiest one first, thrombosis. Thrombosis risk assessment in patients with uh, ET is the 
way that we manage the patients. Life expectancy is close to normal. Usually people are diagnosed in 60s. The life expectancy compared to the population of the patients or people without ET is about the same. I had this discussion yesterday with a fellow from Pakistan, actually, in my clinic, uh, what happens in a patient who has a, a 45 years of age. Younger people have much better prognosis, actually, with ET than older, and it's also close to normal if you read the, the literature for people that are younger than 40. Uh, so that needs to be uh, understood. It's really good uh, uh, prognosis. Now, in terms of uh, prognostic factors for thrombosis, because the pro thrombosis is the leading cause of death, we have two factors, as you know from the history, age and thrombosis, which is described in this slide. This is so-called conventional model, and we, peep, and we give patients aspirin and cytoreductive therapy if they are high risk, and we have hydroxyurea, anagolite, or interferon. The only reason to worry about the platelets, and I'm going to emphasize this one more time a little bit later, the only reason to worry about the platelet number, particularly in a low-risk patient, is extreme thrombocytosis above million and a half when you have acquired von Willebrand factor deficiency, which leads to tendency to bleed. In that case, we advise people to stop the aspirin and consider, as this the quote of the many of the guidelines, consider lowering the platelets to eliminate need of bleeding, and that would be below a million with one of the cytoreductive therapy when the von Willebrand factor deficiency goes away and you can restart the aspirin. Now, there are some changes here in prognostication and dividing the vision of the patients in different group. But I'd like to highlight this particular information one more time in terms of plated number and risk of thrombosis. Because I see in my own clinic, and Dr. Khan knows that very well, a number of patients that come from the community setting, 45 year old with the platelets of a million, million and a hundred thousand on hydroxyurea. There is no need to treat the patients that are younger than 60 with cytoreductive therapy for the platelet number unless it is more than a million and a half. And in that case, you treat the patients for the risk of bleeding. The study that I'm showing here, a randomized prospective study published in JCO two years ago, clearly documented that normalization of the platelets in the low risk patients, if they have platelets up to a million and a half, has no significance for that particular group of patients in any way. So it's just cosmetic control of the platelets. So I'm taking off a number of patients that come through the door that are younger than 60 with ET on hydroxyurea for control of the platelets numbers because the doctor in community setting believes that there is a connection with thrombosis if the platelets are a million or a million and 100,000 or any other number up to a million and a half. So I wanna stress this very strongly here. Now, there is significant change in the prognostication of the thrombotic risk in ET. This is now endorsed by our own United States guideline that uh, came up a couple of years ago. And we are adding another factor, as you can see on this table, the upper part will say that in addition to age thrombotic uh, history, we now add the presence or absence of jak 2 v 617 f mutation as another factor. How does this impact? inform us what to do is in a lower part of the slide. So-called old low-risk patients, right? Younger than 60, never had the thrombosis, are divided in two groups now. Very low-risk and low-risk. So if you have, for example, a 45-year-old man who has ET and has a calreticulin mutation, never had a previous thrombosis, you may not need to give him aspirin at all. That's the question mark I put here. The guidance says consider not giving the aspirin because there is evidence that the aspirin in non jak 2 positive patients that are low risk has no value at all. It just increased risk of bleeding from the aspirin itself. And the high risk patients are divided intermediate to uh, and a high risk as you see in lower part of the slide. An example is again, let's say a 65 year old gentleman who has never had a thrombotic risk and has a calreticulin mutation, so JAK2 negative, I am not giving them cytoreductive therapy anymore. Okay, so this is now endorsed by NCCN guidelines, by European Leukemia Net guidelines, and uh, please consider this in your own practice. All right, the interferon obviously is acceptable alternative to hydroxyurea. This is pegylated interferon experience. On the left side, you have control of the blood cell count. 
It can be achieved in a high proportion of the patients. 76% have complete hematological response. At about 20% do not respond. This mirrors to great degree experience with hydroxyurea. Obviously, the attractive part to it is on the right side that you may see decrease in eject to a little burden, a little burden you can measure if you have the ability to do that. It will go down. But we do not advise to measure that. This is just part of the clinical study. That is not the decision-making point of uh, algorithm. It is about controlling the blood cell count and decreasing traumatic risk with that control. It is only a question what the modification of the jack to little burden means for the patients and it's being explored pros prospectively in a number of studies. I'm mentioning interferon, peglet interferon to alpha 2A, which is Pegasus. We use it off-label because it's not approved because you know, and I will mention that, that in Europe, there was approval of another long-acting interferon called Ropeg interferon for PV, and the owner, the company behind the Ropeg interferon is going to have a global study to study that particular interferon in ET, and we may have in the near future, uh, if it's successful, uh, approved long-acting interferon as therapy for ET. Time will tell. I'm just bringing this up for information sharing. I'm often asked, where is the role for ruxolitinib, a JAK inhibitor in ET, because it's not approved for ET. It has been studied by our colleagues around the globe in, in several different settings, and this is one that I like to show quite a bit. That's from UK, as you probably know, magic study in ET in a second-line setting, where we have about, about the same response to best available therapy. Best available therapy was hydroxyurea, anaglide, or interferon after failing hydroxyurea, so many were re-challenged. In that setting, the control of blood cell count was about the same, but ruxolitinib improved the quality of life. So this actually tells you where I go usually with uh, off-label use of ruxolitinib in ET setting. In advanced ET patients, when there are many symptoms and the counts are not controlled well, I try to optimize what I do with the conventional therapy, but that's not, if that's not possible, I'm trying to then prescribe ruxolitinib for control of those symptoms and the blood cell count uh, in a second line setting. Let's move on to polycetimia vera. Polycetimia vera management is summarized very uh, simply here. In upper part of the table, you see the two factors that are the same as in classical ET assessment, age and history of thrombosis. That would divide the patients in low risk, which you do not treat with cytoreductive therapy, just a phlebotomy and aspirin, and uh, high-risk patients that you obviously we treat with cytoreductive therapy uh, and baby aspirin. So high-risk patients and low-risk patients are clearly defined and divided, but there are always exceptions for use of cytoreductive therapy in low-risk patients, which is in the lower part of the slide. So I'm asked quite often, in low-risk patients, frequent phlebotomy requirement is listed as a reason to perhaps start with cytoreductive therapy. How often these phlebotomies need to happen for me to prescribe? No answer to that. It really has to be individualized and see whether the phlebotomies even cause some side effects. Uh, they do occasionally, but that's not very common. Severe re disease-related symptoms can be present even when you have normal uh, hematocrit, normal meaning you phlebotomize very well. That's another example where I cannot give you the exact number of how bad these symptoms need to be. Platelets, I talk about it, platelet number is not the risk factor for thrombosis. It's the risk factor for bleeding which is very high. And the last one appears to be the most important, progressive leukocytosis because white blood cell count, and I will show you that in a second, has been associated by many uh, as a factor for thrombosis. So progressive leukocytosis, and progressive was put there on purpose, is an indication to treat patients in a lower risk as well. Talking about the quality of life, just to highlight that we are busy physicians, hematologists, we don't have time to talk to patients much. Unfortunately, that's the reality. But if we do, we will figure it out that they are very symptomatic. This is difference in perception of symptom burden between the PV patient and the doctor that is seeing that patient that day. So what you have circled here on the left side, patients saying I'm symptomatic in 90% of the patients. The doctor on the right side, at the same visit, is asked whether the patient is symptomatic. Only 40% of the doctors will say the patient is symptomatic. Quite a discordance. Please ask patients questions, spend a little more time if possible to assess the quality of life. 
White blood cell count has been in many studies associated with risk of bleeding, but it's not full-fledged risk factors as of yet. This is one study showing, you can see from the left to right, the higher the white cell count, the higher the risk of thrombosis or higher the risk of incidence of thrombosis in a retrospective way. That's the key. Why the white blood cell count is not prognostic factor as of yet? Because all the studies from the past indicate it's uh, significant, but there is no prospective study that would say that normalization white cell count makes any difference. So once we start cytoreductive therapy in PV, what do we want to achieve? These are the guidelines. As you see, hematocrit, we all agree on that. Less than 45%, I hope we agree on that. Without phlebotomy, and I'll spend a little time on that. Normalization of the platelets, the weakest point, because platelets do not correlate with thrombosis. White blood cell count, I agree with that. White cell count should be controlled if it's possible. And then number four and five, normal spleen size and disease-related symptoms, it's a quality of life issue. Just briefly, we, I think this is very well established. Controlling a hematocrit below 45% is very valuable because it decreases the risk of mortality and the incidence of major thrombosis. This is the probability of remaining event-free. The higher the red color, the higher uh, curved here is event-free for controlled hematocrit below 45. So a fewer events. And that leads to less of the mortality, right? Because the thrombotic risk is the leading cause of death. So the rate of death from cardiovascular event or major thrombosis is fourfold lower in patients that maintain hematocrit below 45%. The question is, once you start the cytoreductive therapy, should I aim, as the guideline says, to eliminate a need for phlebotomy or not? And so my answer is, I and I tried to do this in my own clinic. Yes, that's why the guidelines are there. They're supported with the data. This is one of the data from Spain. They say if you are on hydroxyurea, the patient is on hydroxyurea, requiring three or more phlebotomies a year, as you see in orange color, then your risk of thrombosis is still too high. So in my own practice, I try to optimize hydroxyurea, eliminate the need for phlebotomy, normalize the white cells, platelets if it's possible, and the spleen and symptoms. I look at all these factors. Now, interferon again has a role in PV as it has in ET. The same type of results as you can see on the right side, hematological response in three quarters of the patients. On the right side, decrease the inject to a little burden. So much so that after seven years of therapy, 20% have no detectable JAK2 by the uh, NGS testing that we use, about 3% sensitivity. Now, is this feasible to give long-term? That's the key. Unfortunately, the answer is no. I mean, long-term, decades, right? So this is our own experience that I show. Effective therapy in a black box, hematological response in 80%, complete hematological response in three quarters, I just showed you that. But duration is about five years, right? Molecular response can be seen. That means decrease injective little burden. The one that appears to be clinically relevant is only complete molecular response because only in that case, patients have a less of a risk of thrombosis or a less of a risk of transformation. But even in that case, it's not completely gone. What is the problem with the, the giving interferon long-term, pegylated interferon? Still continuation with toxicities and discontinuation for toxicities and occasional failures. Now, in this setting, we are looking forward to widespread use of ROPEG interferon. Aropec interferon is the one that uh, I mentioned earlier on. It's approved in Europe for PV. It doesn't say first line, second line, just for polycythemia vera. It has a name Bestremi. As uh, you see at the bottom of the slide, is indicated as monotherapy in adults for treatment of PV without symptomatic splenomegaly because the study did not have patients with symptomatic splenomegaly. It's a frontline study. In that setting, the goal of this therapy is, as by European regulatory bodies, to control blood cell count. That's it, CHR. And so I'm not going to dwell on this much more, but one slide. How effective is ROPEG interferon and why was it approved? It was compared to hydroxyurea. This is the percent of responders as judged by CHR. In red color is the interferon part. In the uh, greenish, blue, uh, gray color is the uh, control, which is hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is better at the beginning, as expected. Interferon tries to work, but it takes time. And only later, after a year and a half, two years, interferon is superior. So it takes a little bit time, uh, build up of the dose for the safety, for uh, tolerance, and then you get the better response than hydroxyurea long-term. That's why it was 
uh, approved any dust obviously control that thromboembolic risk any dust uh, lower the ejectile burden we'll see what does this actually mean long term moving on to uh, hydroxyurea failure what do you do after hydroxyurea you can use obviously interferon um, if, if it's possible the definitions of the failure or intolerance to uh, hydroxyurea were developed on purpose to be uh, able to develop a drug for second line setting which was ruxolitinib as we all know so what the definitions are perhaps not absolutely applicable to everyday practice. These are four clinical studies, but if you just look at what they mean is in upper part in the blue color, not controlling the spleen or the blood cell count. That makes sense. In the lower part on the left side are toxicities. The most common toxicity is mucocutaneous toxicity, ulcers on the legs, uh, lower uh, part of the legs around ankles, and the, uh, the um, ulcers in the mouth, nine out of 10 patients that have a toxicity are mucocutaneous toxicity. I'm uh, still puzzled that I see in consultations patients on hydria that have a big ulcer on the leg and the doctor does not know that that's common, most common nine out of 10 toxicity with hydroxyurea. And of course you have to stop the therapy. So the point here is on the right side that you should optimize the therapy and if with optimal therapy with hydroxyurea, for a decent amount of time, you are not able to control the disease characteristics, and then you change. And you change if uh, ruxolitinib is available to ruxolitinib. Again, you have that interferon as a possibility. Some use busulfan. These are all uh, medications mentioned in a guidelines. We here and in, in large part of the world can use ruxolitinib in a second line. In uh, the randomized study that leads to its approval, that's the design of the study, it showed the benefits which are in a box at the bottom compared to best available therapy, which was hydroxyurea again in most of the patients because there was no alternative much to give. Some got the interference, some got the lenalidomide, some got nothing. In that setting, it was superior to control the hematocrit, white blood cell count, splenomegaly symptoms, and there were fewer thrombotic events as one would expect on a safety analysis, and I'll show you that in a second. So. There was another study called the response study. This is in the middle of the slide. This was a copy of the study that I just showed, but the patients were mandated not to have splenomegaly. So the presence of splenomegaly in PV is not very common. If it's present, it may be symptomatic, but many patients don't have a spleen. So the question was, what is the activity of JAK inhibitor in patients that do not have a spleen? And it's about the same. You look at the first line in the table, hematocrit control, 62% control of hematocrit, in patients without the spleen, if you follow the same line, 60% control in patients with spleen. Complete hematological response in a quarter, improvements in the symptoms about half by great degree. So spleen, yes or no, in PV doesn't really matter. If you are bound to use ruxolitinib, JAK inhibitor in this setting, in a second line setting, these are the expectations, what you're gonna achieve uh, with uh, official response uh, criteria definitions. How long does this benefit last? It lasts very long. This is published a few months ago. The control of hematocrit after five years of therapy with ruxolitinib is about 73%. Control of the spleen, if it's present, about 72%. These are the curves here. And then uh, the last uh, point here that uh, I wanna mention uh, is the control of that thrombolic or thromboembolic uh, risk. This was not the goal of the study. So what I'm showing here is safety analysis just telling us how safe that drug is and of course it look at the thromboembolic events so in a red box is uh, the number of events in the ruxolitinib at the beginning then in the best available therapy and then the last two numbers are uh, patients that crossed over from best available therapy to ruxolitinib and on a face value on of the numbers and percentages no p values here because it's safety analysis it appears that ruxolitinib actually is lowering that thromboembolic risk because obviously it's controlling the blood cell count much better than BAT arm. So it all follows the same story. It's valuable therapy in a second line setting. The last uh, point on the ruxolitinib is that unexpectedly, and we don't really ex explain this very well, I don't know the reason, is that in people who are iron deficient, and almost all the PV patients become iron deficient, some may have a symptoms from iron deficiency. The iron factors normalize. What I'm showing here on the left side, MCV between the two shaded area is normal range. And in green color are patients on ruxolitinib without iron deficiency 
I'm sorry, without iron supplementation, the MCV normalizes. You can look at the in the middle graph, the green color on the ruxolitinib, the iron levels normalize and the ferritin normalizes. We don't really know how and why, but within three to six months, iron measurements normalize when people are given ruxolitinib. Moving on to myelofibrosis. We learn about two types, early prim or primary myelofibrosis, which is prefibrotic myelofibrosis on the left side, and then overt or fibrotic myelofibrosis, which we usually think about when we talk about myelofibrosis, which is also the one that uh, includes post-ET or post-PV myelofibrosis. This is on the, on the right side. I'm going to spend just a minute or two on the early prefibrotic myelofibrosis because there is a lot of confusion about what does this mean. And I try to simplify things as you can see. So I'm going to talk about this on the next slide. But already you can see what is the main problem with early prefibrotic myelofibrosis. It is the vascular events. These people have usually high platelets, right? They were carved out of the traditionally ET patients and said, no, you don't have ET, you have early prefibrotic myelofibrosis. So there you have high counts and they have a problem with vascular events more so than with anything else. We're going to uh, just spend one slide here on early prefibrotic myelofibrosis because I want to make point here that this is not so aggressive neoplasm. Okay, this is the paper that uh, is the best one uh, in terms of explaining the outcome of these people. This is on the left side overall survival. Uh, the uh, more than a thousand patients with ET were uh, reanalyzed and about 20% of them were said not to have ET that they were said to have early prefibrotic myelofibrosis, which is fine. Look at the outcome. The ET patients appear to have uh, the best outcome and when you compare to normal historical control of uh, healthy people, it's about the same. So no effect on the survival. What the early prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients experience is uh, the average survival of about 15 to 17 years. Now 15 is my lucky number today for this slide. It's a 15 years of average survival. What is the risk of transformation to fibrotic myelofibrosis? Right upper part, 15 years, 15% 15 risk of prefibrotic myelofibrosis to become fibrotic. What about the transformation to acute myeloukemia after 15 years, 10%. Okay, so very easy to explain to a patient. Many patients come through the door and say, I have prefibrotic myelofibrosis. I'm gonna be dead in five years. What do I do? I say, not so. The average survival is 15 years or more. Risk of transformation to fibrotic myelofibrosis, 15 years, 15%, and to acute myeloukemia at 15 years is 10%. So we treat as ET, we prognosticate as ET, and we say that, yes, you have perhaps a little bit shorter life expectancy, but you don't need to do the transplant tomorrow because you're not going to be dead in five to seven years. With a fibrotic myelofibrosis situation is different, right? We have an average survival of five to seven years. We heard about prognostication. Prognostication is done to refer the patient to the transplant. The NCCN guidelines, United States guidelines were simplified recently to combine the intermediate one and the low risk together in lower risk because the management is about the same and the intermediate two and high risk by historical IPSS prognostic scoring system into higher risk. And we heard about what prognostic uh, scoring systems to use, but the main goal is to identify patients that have a life expectancy less than five years, which then are subject to transplant. As you can see, by now I'm sure that you look through all of this. Lower risk asymptomatic observation. We don't have a clinical trials. Clinical trials in this setting would be to prevent progression. We don't have those. If they are symptomatic, regardless of the risk of dying, we will be using ruxolitinib for symptoms, Interferon or hydria are reserved for proliferative nature of the disease in this setting. High platelets, high white blood cell count, they are not useful for spleen or general systemic symptoms. That's the distinction between the two, three options here. In a lower part, you see ruxolitinib or in United States, fedratinib, I'll briefly mention that, as an option uh, for high risk disease patients. And of course, then you have anemia drugs uh, for uh, even combination with the uh, JAK inhibitors to help patients in all the three aspects. And the three main aspects are spleen, quality of life, and anemia when we come to treating patients. So to simplify and move on from the, the algorithms, this is a useful table. 
and in the title, I like this way, once we are done with prognostication, then we look at the clinical needs, right? And we say, what is the problem? Anemia, you have a drugs here for anemia. None of these approved, but useful. Standard practice, nothing new. For symptomatic splenomegaly, now in the United States, we have federatinib in addition to ruxolitinib. You see down the table where are the changes, ruxolitinib, federatinib here, and ruxolitinib can extend the life for three years on average. It's on the label for its use in the United States. I understand it's not supported by any other label around the globe, but that's the fact, and I'll show you about that. So, one factor here is the use of the questionnaire to assess the quality of life. If we say that the three main problems are that are uh, that led us to initiate the therapy, general quality of life, symptomatic splenomegaly, and anemia, then MPN10, which can be printed for, uh, from online source, is something that should be used, and we use it in our own practice, to assess that quality of life. We have to objectivize it. You have 10 questions, each from 0 to 10, so 100 points, and typically we would say if any of these 10 is five or more, so 50% or more, or five or more on scale from zero to 10, that's bad enough to treat the patients. Or if the total score is 10 or more, that's bad enough quality of life to treat for quality of life purposes. What does ruxolitinib do? The same for fedratinib, decrease the spleen and improve quality of life. Uh, how often does the spleen goes down? This is a waterfall. Each vertical line is one patient. Normalized uh, from zero, which is baseline spleen size, going down is improvement. You see that almost everybody has a degree of a spleen improvement. So I would say primary refractory patients are about 5% that don't have much of a benefit at all. But everybody else has a degree of a spleen reduction, which is tied to improvement in quality of life. And the one of my patient's pictures are shown here on the right side. You can appreciate what's happening here. But there are three factors on those photos. Not only that the spleen becomes smaller, you can see the change in the uh, ribs. Ribs are seen in upper photo and they're not seen in lower photo because the patient gained weight. So quality of life improvements includes the weight gain, as you probably know from your own practice, ability to walk and this patient when uh, first seen was in wheelchair in a second follow-up after a few months was walking normally. And the third factor here is the timing of that benefit. It has to be, the therapy has to be optimized during the first few months to get this benefit. After two months of therapy in these photos, that's the key for success. Not only that we can appreciate the benefit, but it has to be put in context of when. It is usually during the first few months of therapy. Another factor that is coming up as important is the timing of introduction of therapy. Here is a, a summary of the study, JUMP study, in more than 2,000 patients that did include patients with low, intermediate 1 and 2 and high risk uh, because the initial studies were only focused on intermediate 2 and high risk. And what I'm showing is the spleen response based on a risk of dying. I already told you I don't really like that separation, but it's very useful for what I'm going to talk about and that is the, the degree of a, a spleen response. Degree of spleen response appear every point of time analysis to be much better, as you can see from left to right, for patients with a lower or intermediate one risk disease. Why is that? Why would that be the case? Because the lower risk patients receive higher starting dose. Why? Because they have less of thrombocytopenia and less of anemia. So they can receive the higher starting dose of ruxolitinib, which leads to better spleen response. If you compare the comfort study results, which were intermediate to and high risk patients, to three studies that had intermediate one risk patients, you will see spleen responses are better in the earlier stage patients. There is less of anemia, less thrombocytopenia, clinically relevant anemia, thrombocytopenia, less of infections and less of discontinuation. Now, why am I talking about the spleen responses as being important? Because it has been tied in all the studies so far with the degree of improvement of a longevity. This is from Italy, from common practice in Italy. Overall survival on the left side by spleen response at six months, the spleen responders have a longer survival. Durability of spleen response on the right side, better the spleen response, the longer it lasts. Therefore, my goal in my uh, practice is not to be shy of starting therapy when patients are symptomatic. Symptoms are the key but, and then not to delay the introduction of the therapy and to treat with the maximum safe dose. This is analysis of the correlation between the spleen response and survival from the comfort studies. Upper part is correlation with the 
a percentage decrease in a spleen from 10 to 20, 25 to 35, 35 to 50, more than 50. For each 10% reduction from basal and spleen length at week 24, again, the timeline is the first six months. Each 10% reduction from basal and spleen length led to 9% reduction in the risk of death. So people live longer, the smaller the spleen becomes. And that is the survival benefit, one of my patients, again, at presentation and seven years later, that's what you can achieve with optimal management of the patients. Now, this dosing of ruxolitinib is the key. Here on the left side is a correlation between the dose and the spleen volume response. Clearly, you can see the higher the dose, the better the spleen response. On the right side is the total symptom score, so quality of life improvements. Here, we do not need higher dose. 10 milligrams twice a day is the maximum dose needed for feeling good, but it's not good enough for the spleen. So what happens in the United States, quite often people start with 10 milligrams twice a day and stay at 10. They don't want to go higher. They start, first of all, low to avoid any myelosuppression. The higher the dose, the more of myelosuppression. But they start at 10. They have excellent quality of life improvement. You don't go up. The spleen is okay responding, but not optimally. And it doesn't last that long. And of course, the survival is not optimally derived as well. So my message usually is, Avoid starting with low dose, go by the lever. If you start low, escalate quickly to maximum safe dose because uh, that will benefit the patients not only in the quality of life and the spleen to degree, but also prolonged survival. And the doses less than 10 minutes twice a day are not effective long term. Now, the one paper that is outstanding, and it, uh, if anything from these presentations that is of significance, this is the one that will summarize everything they said so far. Please take a look, Palandri on Target 2017, which with the data supported, with the data in that paper, will describe what I said just now. The influence of disease stage and quality of response and the influence of ruxolitinib dose. So earlier intervention with a higher dose will benefit everybody. Now, we worry about the myelosuppression. So what do we do in our own practice? Platelets go down, there are guidelines how to adjust the dose and platelets. Hemoglobin goes down. There are no guidelines on how to adjust the dose for, for anemia, but people usually use low dose or cut back the dose quite uh, a bit immediately if the anemia develops. Look at the hemoglobin curve. It goes down, but then there is a rebound. Well, for several reasons. One, there is a natural rebound, which we cannot explain even without those adjustments. That's one obvious factor. The other factor in this particular curve is people did reduce the dose. The number three is what I do in my own practice is combined with the anemia drug. I already alluded to that. So if the patient is anemic uh, already, or we are seeing anemia developing on ruxolitinib, we would add anemia drug. We look at erythropoietin level. If it's below 125 million units, we would, we're gonna go the erythropoietin injections. If it's not, if it's very high, then danazol. Uh, we also try thalidomide, 50 milligrams sometimes. It may work as well. And we don't want to cut the dose right away or under those patients because I want that spleen to become as small as possible during the first six months. If you are worried about the myelosuppression, there is alternative. There is alternative. This was a poster at a European Hematology Association meeting uh, last year. Alternative ruxolitinib dosing regimen where you do start with 10 milligrams twice a day, but then you go up. So alternative dosing regimen can be alternative to your worry or my worry that I'm going to worsen already present anemia or increase the frequency of transfusions. Look what happens. You go with 10, then you go to 15, then you go to 20 if you need. And with that approach, you may have 56% response rate. So it's not uh, trivial. It, uh, it, I can say at least as good as with uh, the alternative way of giving high dose at the beginning and then decreasing. So Many of my colleagues here are endorsing this type of approach. 10 milligrams twice a day, but then you have to go up if you can in a safe way to go to 15 to 20 to 25 twice a day. And it's always twice a day to get best out of it for survival of the benefit. And this is the hemoglobin over time with this particular approach. So, to, so consider this particular approach uh, if there is a concern about myelosuppression with the standard dosing regimen. So how I use ruxolitinib in myelofibrosis indicated for splenomegaly or symptoms regardless of risk of dying. Anemia is not contraindication. If it develops, I manage it as I described. 
I try to maintain patients at the maximum tolerated dose or maximum safe dose and early to get the spleen as small as possible to get that survival benefit out there for all my patients, not only selective. Something that I did not talk much about is the, are the last three bullets. Avoid abrupt interruption of ruxolitinib. I think that's very well known, but there are no guidelines exactly how to manage a situation where you need to stop it. At the European Hematology Association meeting three months ago, there was a summary from Italian experience which said people do a, a lot of different things and there was no uniformity whatsoever. We would be tapering ruxolitinib slowly by five milligrams every five to 10 days. And then also consider using prednisone as has been published uh, to counteract the rebound in the symptoms. That obviously is a worry in patients where you have to stop when the patient is responding to ruxolitinib. If there is absolutely no benefit to ruxolitinib anymore in any point, then you can just stop it uh, and that is, that's fine. But if there is a benefit to it, but you have to stop it, taper it, and consider giving steroids if there are any return of the symptoms before you start something else. The last one, be aware of rare possibility of opportunic infections, hepatic infections, particularly in 5% of the patients. We screen patients for the hepatitis. In some parts of the world, uh, it's necessary to look at the TB because the reactivation of TB or hepatitis have been described. Other opportunistic infections are extremely rare, but noticed. And monitor for skin cancer. That comes from the PV studies of ruxolitinib. People who were on a long-term hydroxyurea that increased risk of skin cancer itself, when switched to uh, ruxolitinib, may have also uh, increased risk of skin cancer, and I send my patients like that to a skin doctor for surveillance. Let's talk briefly about fedratinib. Fedratinib is not available outside the United States, but it may become. So just briefly, what happened with this, this is a study done many years ago. Fedratinib is now approved for intermediate two and high risk myeloid fibrosis, where uh, the study uh, was comparing fedratinib 500 milligrams, 400 milligrams, or placebo uh, over a period of time. And the dose that is now approved is 400 milligrams a day. That's a daily because the half-life is uh, much longer than ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib always have to be given twice a day. Fedratinib achieves a 37% response in the spleen, 40% in the symptoms, so about the same as ruxolitinib. The difference is really in the safety. One needs to uh, measure timing level because uh, the fedratinib appears to be interfering with the timing uptake in the GI tract, which may lead with sporadic, very rare, vernic encephalopathy, uh, that is neurological, central neurological toxicity. So you need to measure it and make sure the patient is not timing deficient and supplement timing during the therapy if necessary. It may also, that's at the bottom of the slide, cause diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting in a two-thirds to three-quarters of the patients lower grade, but that really requires anti-nausea medications or anti-diarrheals. Now, the, the, uh, the fedratinib has been studied in the setting of uh, ruxolitinib failure, and to summarize this uh, slide, this was not uh, specifically approved for, but we utilize it, uh, uh, we do utilize the fedratinib in the setting after ruxolitinib in the United States because of the study that was published in March this year showing that 30% uh, of the patients, I'm circling this with my mouse, uh, uh, and the 27% response rate in the symptoms can be seen after ruxolitinib. The indication for its use in the United States is just for mild fibrosis. It is being studied, this is on the right side, in two studies, freedom studies that are meant to really prove that fedratinib is, a value, uh, is uh, effective therapy after ruxolitinib and maybe then the label for its use may uh, be changed in the United States and maybe fedratinib will be approved in other parts of the globe for ruxolitinib failures. So these studies are underway. What can you do after ruxolitinib failure? Not really much. Fedratinib is not available around the globe. Standard practice, best available therapy medications don't really work. We highly, highly advise to enroll patients in any study uh, to benefit them possibly because best available therapy does not really work well. You can consider rechallenging patients with ruxolitinib after a few weeks of being off. Uh, what I'm showing is the spleen reduction from zero going down the same way as before. The blue color is the initial challenge with the ruxolitinib. Green is second time and some patients even rechallenged a third time. That's possible because the loss of a sensitivity to ruxolitinib is not really, in most of the patients, 
uh, tied to any genetic abnormalities or anything like that. It can be then uh, postulated, and you can see from the experience here that patients can be sensitive again. And so that's one option in a second line. If uh, you use best available therapy and there are no clinical studies, you don't know what else to do, rechallenging is a possibility. Some patients, about 20 to 25% of the patients progress to acute myeloid leukemia. That's the single most common cause of death, but 80% uh, die from complications of myeloid fibrosis itself. That's why I spend a little bit less time on the uh, acute myeloid leukemia part. But here, there is a quite a change as well over the last couple of years. You will now see that after uh, detecting an elevated blast in blood or bone marrow, we would say the patient is either in accelerated phase, 10 to 19% blast, or a blastic phase, 20% or more, which is AML. But we would be treating these people e the same way. So it's not only treating patients when they're in acute myeloid leukemia phase. We treat everybody who has 10% or more accelerated phase with the same approach as if they were in uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And so what would you do if there is a possibility of transplant? We would induce remission with hypomethylation agents as a standard practice for two or three months. And if that doesn't work, we would do then only then intensive induction chemotherapy followed by the transplant. Most of people are older and sick, not the transplant candidates. Therefore, we utilize what is on the right lower part clinical trial or hypomethylation agents or a low intensity induction chemotherapy. Cladribin low dose RSC, for example, or low dose RSC sub Q alone or cladribin alone. Hypomethylation agents became a standard practice. In that setting, we still use ruxolitinib to control spinomegaly and systemic symptoms. We don't cut back on that benefit. We utilize this ruxolitinib at 10 milligrams twice a day and let it be like this without any change because the change will be due in blood cell count due to other therapies. So we kind of fixed on a 10 million twice a day ruxolitinib in combination with HMAs or chemotherapy for control of spleen and symptoms and will not interrupt the therapy even if the platelets go down due to HMAs or chemotherapy. So where are we going from here? If we have uh, JAK inhibitors approved, ruxolitinib for myeloid fibrosis and fedratinib in the United States approved as well. We have other studies with JAK inhibitors underway. Fedratinib, I told you that there are studies to really have it approved as a second line choice. There are other two JAK inhibitors that are being developed. One, momelotinib in second line setting for symptom and anemia benefit. That drug appears to be a little bit different than other JAK inhibitors, possibly improving anemia. So the the developmental part uh, of the, its uh, attempt to be approved has been changed to control of symptoms and anemia instead of symptoms and a spleen. Pacritinib is being developed as a choice for patients with platelets below 50, where we hardly ever use uh, federatinib or ruxolitinib. We do occasionally at the very low dose, but this is an uh, area of, uh, of medical need. Other medical uh, studies or other clinical studies are being done Many are combining JAK inhibitors with something else. If you go from the top, you see hypometallation agents in combination. That became already standard practice, as I said, for accelerated and blastic phase. Then the anemia drugs. We, anemia is usually a very big problem. And then other medications being combined uh, to improve the spleen and symptoms control on top of uh, ruxolitinib, basically, at this time. Most of the studies underway are combination studies at the moment around the globe. But there are many other drugs that are being tested as a single agent in a second line setting. And I'll just give you a flavor of uh, what else are we doing in terms of targeting different aspects of the disease. It is not only about inhibition of the JAKSTAT pathway anymore, which is underlying biological problem. We have here MDM2 inhibitor, LSD1 inhibitor, BET inhibitors. You see a number of epigenetic modifiers and all kinds of different other targets that are known to be part of the pathobiology of MPN and are being targeted with these new agents. So I thank you so much, and I hope that I use uh, my time uh, wisely for you to learn from my experience, and I'm looking forward to a lovely discussion uh, with everybody online. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Serge. It was such a beautiful, detailed presentation of management of MPN. At least I learned a lot, and I think everybody on board learned a lot. It will be very useful in our clinics. 
I have, um, and it would definitely help the Pakistani patients with myeloid proliferative neoplasm. I will request my panelist, uh, Dr. Ayaz Meer, Dr. Nigar Chebaz, and Dr. Uzma Zaidi, uh, to please give their comments and if there are any questions. Um, the excellent presentations. Uh, the free papers were very good. Uh, and I just want to make a comment about uh, APML uh, by Dr. Hamad. It was an excellent presentation. The, my only comment is that uh, our results are excellent as compared to uh, neighboring countries. Mm, the reason I think is uh, that patients who diet, uh, patients of APML who diet, uh, they came late and majority of them had already TIC. So uh, this was uh, before 2008. After 2008 and 2009, uh, because of excellent blood component support, and we are thankful to AFIT that we uh, were able to save many of the patients who came with DIC. And uh, uh, about the protocols, APML4 and ATO ETRA are excellent protocols, but we have seen that AIDA protocol was also very good. And uh, majority of the patients who were treated with AIDA and APML4 uh, are still alive. So uh, DIC is the major, uh, I think, risk factor and major morbidity associated with APML. And uh, we were able to save many of the patients. Uh, excellent results. And uh, about the last presentation, MDR1 gene, I want to ask the question from Dr. Shaista, I think. Yes, Dr. Shaista. Uh, she, yeah, she has um, mentioned that they included the patients of new, uh, newly diagnosed AML uh, and uh, patients who were already on treatment. I just want to ask a question uh, whether they were de novo AML or they were also patients uh, who transformed from some other um, MPN uh, like uh, CML or uh, myeloproliferative disorders transformed to AML because he has mentioned that number of patients had splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. Were they only de novo AML patients or uh, secondary AML also? Uh, Ma'am, there were few patients, uh, I told that there was history of uh, previous hematological malignancy. Uh, there were few patients, but mostly were de novo. Mostly were de novo and they were uh, on tr uh, already on treatment? Uh, both. Uh, newly diagnosed so, as well as on chemo. So what are you planning about the further management plan? Are, to, uh, are you planning to include this MDR1 gene uh, mutation in your primary panel uh, at the time of diagnosis or any prognostic impact or any uh, what is your plan what are you going to do with this uh, study uh, ma'am first of all to yahi hai ki pakistan mein is tarah ki koi study hui nahi hai jisme mdr1 polymorphism dekha gaya ho to hopefully to include it in the panel in the primary diagnostic panel because we are our main aim is to benefit the patient. Yes, exactly. So, are you planning to include this in primary panel? Hopefully. Uh, thank you very much, Ma'am Nigat. Regarding acute promyelistic leukemia study, there was also another very interesting observation and rather unfortunate as well that there were many relapses and deaths during maintenance which we normally uh, do not expect in acute promyelistic leukemia i think the main reason was the lack of compliance in our patients uh, in our patients yeah. who are poor so it is very difficult for them to take the maintenance therapy for two years uh, we normally don't take the uh, as a habit our patients do not even take the treatment of diabetes regularly hypertension regularly and once they are free of disease uh, they are PCR negative, they are able to resume their normal life. I think compliance is an issue uh, which needs to be considered. And here the role of ATO ETRA comes into play that if it is low risk and we are treating them on ATO ETRA protocol, then there's no maintenance. So once consolidation is over, uh, so there is no further treatment. So that was an unfortunate part that they had actually completed their induction, completed their consolidation, the difficult part, and they had actually uh, relapsed and died during maintenance. There's another observation because uh, we have published our study results of uh, non-acute promyelocytic uh, leukemia AML patients and the majority of our patients were young. 
they were less than 40 years of age so young it is very difficult for young patients to remain compliant with the maintenance therapy and uh, uh, results of that study showed that uh, younger patients uh, as dr sara has mentioned they do better with the uh, chemotherapy uh, but in apml patients uh, requ who required maintenance therapy younger patients i think are difficult to uh, to be compliant with the maintenance but older patients are good uh, my few older patients are uh, still alive after 10 years of chemotherapy because they remain compliant with the therapy uh, very good point rahi thank you uh, so um, another question from you ma'am so what do you recommend um, like in a country like pakistan uh, where do you place the transplant in acute uh, myeloid leukemia what are your recommendations for a developing country like pakistan that uh, whether we should transplant intermediate risk high risk so where do you place the transplant indication for aml for our patients from dr saira uh uh, uh memnikat i was just like i just wanted to ask your comments regarding okay. uh, where do you want uh, the transplant to uh, what should be the transplant indication for our patients of acute myeloid leukemia in your opinion in a developing uh, country yeah, like I pakistan just, uh, i have, we are uh, not doing all the uh, genetic mutations uh, fish analysis and molecular analysis in our patient because of financial constraints and non availability of these tests in our lab so we don't know whether uh, the patients we label low risk or intermediate risk are actually low risk or intermediate risk because majority of our patients who relapse uh, um, after within a year or two year were actually high risk patients who were initially labeled low risk or intermediate risk so i think younger patients who are placed at intermediate risk group should be transplanted because uh, a younger age they do better with the transplant and we don't know whether they fall in which group uh, treatment uh, these diagnostic facilities are not available and they are very expensive also absolutely so, uh, absolutely absolutely agreed thank so you we have much. seen that we have transplanted patients who are in intermediate risk and they do better with the transplant they are still in remission thank you very much ma'am so um dr saf uh, has fortunately joined uh, the it glitches are over so um it is our privilege to have dr saf with us dr saf is a seasoned clinical hematologist and transplant physician uh, he is currently working as director bone marrow transplant and cellular therapy program clatterbridge cancer center uk so i would like dr saf for his talk uh but you're not able to see my presentation let me <laughs> can you see it now is it okay uh yes it's okay perfect uh thank you very much for uh, inviting me to do this talk uh and uh, good morning it's very early hours of the morning here in the uk at the moment um and thank you for your kind introduction Uh, right here. Uh, so, in the next few minutes, what I will do is to talk about um, MRD in acute myeloid leukemia, and I'll try and answer some uh, basic questions. So, I'll talk about um, what different techniques for MRD monitoring can be utilized in acute myeloid leukemia, and whether any of those techniques is better than the others. Uh, I will also talk about what MRD tells us and. Um, whether any of these techniques that we use uh, give us the same information or different information and uh, most important we will talk about um, uh, what can we do when we have positive mrd and um, i think it will be fair to say that uh, aml mrd is most relevant at the moment and as compared to all mrd uh, it is more challenging as well because the role of mrd is relatively easy in all and uh, i think the real question in the field is mrd in acute myeloid leukemia so we've been using various techniques for disease monitoring in acute leukemias for a long period of time um we we have experience of using fluorescent in situ hybridization for nearly 40 years 
Uh, we use immunofluorescent probes in order to detect DNA sequences. Um, and the advantage of FISH over conventional cytogenetics in this area is that it's a quick process, it's uh, very specific, and we're able to analyze the cells at any stage of cell cycle. However, uh, as we all know, it is not a very sensitive method of uh, determining residual disease. Uh, we've been using multi-parametric flow cytometry for a little while now. Uh, we try and identify immunological footprint of leukemic clone by using this technique. Uh, there are two basic uh, modalities that we, or strategies, that's the accurate term that we follow. Um, one is leukemia-associated immunophenotyping, where we have the presenting sample. We know the uh, cell population of interest, and we look at the uh, antigen expression on the surface of those clones, um, and then we follow it up. However, we can follow a strategy called different from normal or DFN um, strategy, where we identify in a general population of hematopoietic progenitor cells, we try and identify any abnormal expression of antigens. Um, this has also got some advantage that we're able to also do a surveillance and uh, look at whether there are some disappearing clones and so on and so forth. Um, advantage of this uh, technique is that um, we are able to find MRD um, in 90% of the acute leukemia cases uh, by using this technique and exclude apoptotic cells. So it's quite clinically relevant. Um, however, there are some disadvantages here. Um, it's very difficult to standardize this technique and it largely depends on interpretive abilities of the investigators. So it's very, very subjective. Um, ELN MRD Working Party has come up with some recommendations that were published in 2017. And they suggest that we use three layers of um, markers in order to um, have an accurate estimation of MRD by using multiparametric flow cytometry. So there would be early precursor markers, myelolinage markers, and then differentiation agents. So when you combine them together, you're able to find the evident expression. Uh, this, they recommend that we should use at least eight color flow cytometry, and in order for the um, uh, test to be meaningful, we need to have at least half a million to one million events. We've also got experience of using polymerase chain reaction for a little while, where we apply amplification of DNA or RNA. Um, however, again, the problem with this is that you need to have a known target and if you don't have a target in acute myeloid leukemia you can't use mrd um, and monitoring uh, by using pcr so it's not a universally available test uh, time is another issue however with digital droplet pcr you're able to standardize the test and you're able to uh, perform the test relatively quickly with and it has become less labor intensive but um, as I said earlier, you're not able to apply it to majority of cases with acute myeloid leukemia when you're using PCR-based MRD monitoring, and I'll come to that in a bit more detail. Newer forms of MRD include next-generation sequencing. Uh, so advantage of next-generation sequencing is that we're able to perform simultaneous uh, profiling um, of multiple genes uh, at the same time. So. Um, as a result, you not only get a very deep level of MRD, but you're also able to have a very broad um, application. You're able to have a very broad-based information. Now, whilst that can be an advantage, that can also be a disadvantage because then you need to find out what's the background noise, what's the relevance of all the information that you're getting and uh, whether that information that you're getting by next generation sequencing is applicable to your particular uh, case. Now, the uh, applicability of this uh, next generation sequencing depends upon your technique and the panel that you're using. And with very broad panel, you can expand it to um, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the cases. So it's got a um, uh, very good uh, application. However, um, if you use a smaller panel, you may not be able to apply it to many patients who have been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and you want to monitor their MRD. So this slide summarizes the uh, various techniques that we can use in order to monitor the disease. And as you can see, uh, over the last uh, so many years, we've moved from our ability of detecting one leukemic cell in 10 or 100 
to a stage now where with PCRs and next generation sequencing, we're able to determine whether there is a single cell which is uh, leukemic in a population of a million or more cells. So what does MRD tell us? Um, the first prospective study that was uh, published in this field, uh, it came from the pediatric population. Uh, it was the outcome of the ML02 trial. Pediatrician had a, uh, had more experience of using MRD, uh, multiparametric low cytometry with their experience of acute lymphoblastic leukemia at the time. So not surprisingly, they published these data using four color flow cytometry with an MRD cutoff put at 0.1%. And not surprisingly, it showed the prognostic significance of MRD. As you can see, if you have positive MRD at induction one and induction two, you are likely to do very badly. However, they also determined um, and described this uh, dilemma which uh, exists to date. Um, that is that um, you know there is a problem, you know there is MRD, but what can you do about it? So they noticed that when you increase the um, dose of chemotherapy by adding high dose cytarabine based chemotherapeutic agents, it did not increase the uh, patients who became MRD negative. In adult population, the first uh, prospective trial uh, which was um, uh, published was from Hogan uh, Group in association with Swiss, uh, published in 2013 where um, again they used uh, eight color multiparametric flow cytometry and these are the results of the ML42A clinical trial. Again the MRD cutoff was set at 0.1 percent and they confirmed uh, the uh, MRD as an independent prognostic factor. However they also described um, associating MRD with other biological parameters of the disease and as you can see here um, when you couple MRD with um, uh, risk stratification of acute myeloid leukemia, you are able to increase the sensitivity of your um, uh, prognostic model for acute myeloid leukemia. As you can see that if you couple MRD with high risk acute myeloid leukemia, uh, all cases um, uh, will last within one year. Uh, Ravandi in 2017 published MD Anderson data. Uh, on MRD in acute myeloid leukemia. They used eight color multiparametric flow cytometry. What's interesting about the study is that they used uh, very intensive regimes, including phlegida and clefarabin based regimes and cladrobin in association with anthracycline and high dose um, cytarabin. So these were younger patients. They went up to six cycles of um, chemotherapy, um, initial induction cycle, followed by attenuated chemotherapy. And again, they confirmed the prognostic significance, which has already been uh, shown in uh, a number of other studies. But the, what they also showed was that at induction um, with these um, intensive regimes, you're able to have MRD negative cases in 79%, which increased to 86% during consolidation, but did not increase any further at the end of treatment. In other words, you keep giving the same intense cycle of chemotherapy and you don't achieve any further significant improvement in the outcome. So you need to adopt to a different um, uh, strategy when you're trying to improve MRD. Um, UK MRC published these data in 2016. Um, these were results from uh, MRC ML17 trial. 346 patients who were uh, diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia were found to have NPM mutation. So this just shows the um, um, prognostic significance of a different uh, strategy, different technique, which is molecular MRD. And again, they confirmed the prognostic significance of uh, MRD by demonstrating that if you were MRD positive, and this is a very specific time point that they selected, which was um, MRD in peripheral blood at the end of second cycle of induction chemotherapy, and they demonstrated there was a significant difference in the outcome if you are MRD positive at that point. Uh, in this particular sample. However, there is something interesting in these data which shows that uh, even though FLIC3 uh, ITD is always considered to be poor risk um, feature of acute myeloid leukemia, even if you carry FLIC3 ITD mutation and at the end of second cycle of induction chemotherapy, if you became negative um, uh, on MRD assessment using NPM as a marker, 
um, your outcome was actually quite reasonable with only 35% risk of relapse over five years. It means that a significant proportion of patients with flip 3 ITD you will be able to uh, cure without any further intervention. Um, so what about NGS? Um, these are relatively new techniques and um, uh, one of the beautiful kind of data has been presented by um, this um, uh, Dutch group in 2018 in New England Journal of Medicine. So what they did was in their patients, they performed deep sequencing using NGS. Um, and as you can see, um, what's very interesting um, in these data is that about 90% of the patients, whilst they used our 54-panel um, myeloid uh, marker um, to monitor the MRD, they found that 90% of the patients had at least one or more mutations. Um, even more important and interesting was that about 50% of these patients, despite completing all cycles of chemotherapy, continued to have at least one or more mutation. And these mutations were not just in a very low level, the variant allele frequency of these mutations varied between 0.02% to 30%. So in other words, despite achieving full morphological remission, a significant proportion of these patients continued to demonstrate mutations that were that existed uh, at the time of uh, presentation. So does it have any prognostic value? Um, so these are data on the same patients um, in non-DTA, and I'll come to DTA in a second because that is an important message. So in non-DTA mutation, they did demonstrate that there was a significant difference in terms of uh, relapse when the patient was MRD positive uh, whilst doing an uh, MRD assessment with next generation sequencing. However, this is really important because as I explained earlier, when you do next generation sequencing, you get a lot of information, um, but all those mutations do not carry the same significance. So in some mutations such as DNMT3A, tax 2 and ASXL1, um, even if you have very high variant level frequency uh, with a high disease burden, you would not that would not carry any prognostic significance in the outcome of the patients so similar to those who did not have any uh, MRD positivity on MRD assessment. Um, they performed another um, uh, important analysis. They coupled um, MRD using next generation sequencing with multi-parametric flow cytometry, which they were doing simultaneously. And again, they were able to um, uh, identify a group of patients where um, by using two different techniques, they were positive. The relapse risk was as high as 75% compared to those who were negative on both uh, assessments. Uh, where the relapse risk uh, was 25% uh, uh, over a period of five years. So um, what are the problems with all different kinds of mutation that you can identify either in next generation sequencing or by using PCR-based methods? Um, we've already talked about the DTA mutations. Um, we understand now that these mutations do exist in pre leukemic clones in the form of uh, clonal hemopoiesis of significance. So even if you have got rid of acute myeloid leukemia, there is still uh, existence of um, these uh, mutations in the pre leukemic clones. So leukemia is eradicated, but you will continue to see MRD positivity, which carries no real significance. Um, we also have germline mutations where you will continue to demonstrate high expression of um, uh, those mutations, which uh, despite eradicating acute myeloid leukemia, you will continue to uh, see in the patients. Um, and then there are other markers such as FLIP3 ITD and FLIP3 TKD, which are associated with frequent loss or gain of mutation, and hence the prognostic, hence the significance of these markers as MRD is very questionable because you can have a significant leukemic clone but complete eradication of flip 3 ITD uh, because of um, loss of mutation. Uh, this is a quick slide to show you that all different kinds of um, mutation analysis, when we use them, um, uh, different mutations, when we use them as MRD marker, uh, can follow a different kinetics. 
Um, but what's universally acknowledged now um, as per uh, the body of data that is available is that uh, once you have a rising level of MRD, you're in trouble. So regardless of how you're following the patients, if there's a rising level of MRD, uh, you need to do something about it. So what is that we can do about it when we know that there is MRD? So uh, Araki from uh, Seattle published these data on uh, patients who underwent allogenic metabolic stem cell transplantation. Um, there were 359 patients who um, were reported in this study. They used multiparametric flow cytometry using pan color <coughs> flow cytometer. And what they demonstrated was that if you were MRD negative, you would do reasonably well. But if you were MRD positive, your outcome was as poor as the patients who had active disease. And I think this is really important. This just showed that the MRD positivity before bone marrow, stem, bone marrow transplantation, metabolic stem cell transplantation, is a bad news. So we needed to do something about it. So even if you did allogenic transplant, it may not necessarily change the outcome. This is a very important study published in 2019 by CIBMTR. <clears throat> so these patients were already treated on a BMT CTN0901 trial. And if you remember, within this clinical trial, the patients were randomized to receive reduced intensity conditioning versus myeloablative uh, conditioning transplant. And if you could focus on figure C on the screen, um, I would like to point out here that uh, what it uh, what the study showed was that if you were MRD negative and you're receiving reduced intensity conditioning or myeloablative conditioning transplant, you had a reasonable outcome. However, if you uh, uh, received a reduced intensity conditioning transplant and you were MRD positive, as is shown by the curve of overall survival, which is which is below 40%, your outcome was significantly worse compared to the rest of the cohorts. So in other words, you were able to mitigate the uh, positive MRD by escalation of your conditioning regimen in this cohort of patients. And again, um, this study was performed retrospectively by doing deep analysis uh, using NGS. So compared to previous study, this was a slightly different technique. <laughs> Uh, Italians published uh, these data recently uh, as the outcome of um, uh, uh, AML1310 clinical trial. And also there's an important message here. Um, in this uh, trial, for the first time, a group used prospectively uh, a risk-adopted treatment approach. So we all acknowledge, we all understand that MRD is significant. Um, how can we utilize it in our clinical practice? So in this study, um, they treated acute myeloid leukemia patients. However, intermediate risk patients where the outcome optimum um, management remains relatively unknown, um, they offered patients treatment based on their MRD, and this was done prospectively. So they offered autologous transplant to the patients who were MRD um, negative at the end of um, induction and those patients were MRD positive, they offered uh, those patients allogenic metabolic stem cell transplant. And as you can see, the outcome of patients who received autologous transplant was comparable to those patients who were MRD uh, positive who received allogenic stem cell transplant. And I think this is a very important message that just shows that in a significant proportion of patients, and you're able to uh, reduce the intensity of treatment, um, if you call it reduce intensity treatment, but clearly the outcome of autologous transplant in terms of the toxicity and risk is significantly lower than allergen transplant. So you're able to reduce the toxicity of treatment and you still achieve the same uh, outcome as you would with in a higher risk group patients using allergen extensive transplant. So in other words, if you've given them allergen extensive transplant, you would not have done any service to them. Um, UK MRC published these data in um, uh, a few months back, and these are the patients who were treated in the ML17 trial. Um, 107 patients who were initially um, <coughs> found to have NPN mutation, their MRD assessment was possible. Uh, those patients went on to receive allergenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And not surprisingly, they confirmed uh, the same finding that um, using NPN as a molecular marker for MRD 
uh, the outcome was worse if the MRD was positive in the peripheral blood or on the bone marrow. And again, this analysis was done at the end of second cycle of induction um, uh, using peripheral blood and uh, bone marrow samples. But what they also did was to try and further uh, refine uh, the, these groups based on their outcome and they uh, put them into category of those who were truly MRD negative and those patients who had lower uh, burden of MRD and the cutoff was set at 200 copies per million ABL transcripts in the peripheral blood and 1,000 copies per um, uh, million trans ABL transcripts in the bone marrow. And as you can see, again, not surprisingly, those patients with a higher uh, MRD burden uh, did uh, extremely badly or had 13% um, overall survival uh, after they were given allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. However, when you perform subgroup analysis, um, it comes out with some interesting findings. So as you can see in this figure, that if you have high MRD burden, so this is a subgroup analysis of those patients who simultaneously had FLIP3 ITV uh, with NPM, where NPM was used as the MRD marker. As you can see, if you have high MRD at the end of um, uh, your treatment before the transplantation, um, you will um, see that the patients will do badly regardless of their FLIP3 status. However, if you have intermediate or low MRD, um, the FLIP3 status becomes important because there, if you are FLIP3 positive, you'll do badly. And if you're FLIP3 negative, you will do um, reasonably well uh, with a uh, percentage of survival of 77%. Um, however, equally interesting is these data on the right-hand side of this um, slide. And as you can see that if you were MRD negative before the transplantation at a certain time point using NPM, um, FLIP3 becomes less important because if you're FLIP3 uh, negative, you have a decent outcome. But if you're FLIP3 positive, even there, a significant proportion of the patients will have a survival of 77%, uh, which again shows that you're able to mitigate the prognostic significance of FLIP3 um, if you achieve the MRD um, uh, negativity uh, on peripheral blood. Uh, based on these findings, they were able to categorize these patients into two large groups, um, those with low risk and those with high risk. So high risk included those patients who were MRD positive or those who had low MRD um, uh, with uh, FLIP3 positivity and those um, low risk group who were MRD negative or those patients who were uh, FLIP3 um, wild type with low uh, MRD positivity. And as you can see, the difference in the outcome between these two groups is substantial, 82% uh, versus 17% long-term survival. So this is just a slide to show that ELN has come up with some recommendations, um, and it obviously depends upon your um, institutional practice, the kind of MRD techniques that are available and so on and so forth. But um, uh, ELN um, recommends doing MRD as a standard clinic, um, uh, standard of care for patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Um, I would suggest that um, doing uh, MRD assessment, if you have those tools, at least the end of second cycle of chemotherapy or end of treatment, and um, whenever you can, if you have resources, uh, continue to monitor it until two years uh, following the treatment. So in summary, there is no single MRD technique that is perfect. All techniques have their weaknesses and strengths and um, MRD should be assessed at specific time, time points because different MRDs may have different significance uh, when they are positive and negative. Some uh, MRDs you will continue to see, as we know from our experience using core binding factor leukemia, that we can continue to have positive results in some of those cases for a while after the after completion of treatment. MRD definitely carries prognostic significance and it can predict the relapse and outcome of patients even before transplant. Um, but you may be able to also by um, using or adopting different um, therapeutic modalities, uh, you can mitigate the MRD positive um, status and the prognostic significance that comes with it. However, uh, we're in dire need for prospective studies in, these, uh, in this area so that we could 
further identify what's the best strategy. And hopefully in future, once we have um, uh, access to other um, uh, strategies of treatment, uh, such as monoclonal antibodies, etc., we may be able to improve the outcome in these patients like we have done in acute lymphoblastic Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saif, for such an enlightening talk. Um, I will request the panelists uh, to ask any questions or comments uh, on this session. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Saif. Um, uh, thank you very much for making us uh, wiser about MRD and transplantation. So uh, my question is, uh, what should we do when uh, we uh, want to take the patient to transplant and after two courses of chemotherapy, they are still MRD uh, positive? Uh, to recommend uh, further one or two courses of chemotherapy or um, take him or her to transplant with um, RIC or myeloblative conditioning uh, followed by um, GBL, prophylactic BLI or uh, fine tuning with expression? Um, I think that's a very important question and thanks for asking this question. Um, the management strategy would obviously depend upon um, age of the patient, comorbidities, and so on and so forth. But it is uh, there's definitely plenty of da data that show that if you are persistently positive in terms of your MRD, then you need to do something about it. So one approach, for example, um, adopted by MRC would be that if you're persistently positive, you uh, follow the route of those patients who are deemed high risk. So you can escalate your chemotherapy before. So you can, um, you know, we have clinical trial where you're using a more intensive regime such as Flegida. You, uh, in a center where there's no clinical trial, you can consider, for example, CPX. You can consider adding an additional uh, agent set of venid such as venetoclox and so on and so forth. So you try and um, uh, mitigate this MRD, you try and abrogate um, that to achieve MRD negativity because you know that the outcome will be um, worse in these patients. It Clearly, when you're treating a patient as a high risk, you need to um, uh, improve the consolidation strategies as well. And uh, yes, you can consider early transplant in these patients. And um, following transplant, I think it becomes difficult. Uh, the conditioning intensity that you use in transplant, um, I would imagine even in your part of the, you know, uh, in, in the rest of the world as well, would depend upon the age of the patient. Um, but they will be uh, pushed towards using more intense regimes um, if, you were, if the patient was able to tolerate that. And the other thing that will be different would be after you've completed the uh, treatment, you may want to uh, monitor them. Um, that is where the difficulty lies because, um, uh, unfortunately, like uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where you have different subgroups where you're able to add in additional treatments like infertility positive, you can add in TKI, you can use the entomb map. In AML, we don't have those um, options as yet. But with the advent of um, um, agents such as azacitidine and oral azacitidine, which will hopefully become available in not too distant future, uh, which will carry reduced toxicity, you may be able to add that on to the cocktail to improve the outcome. So you think that um, post-transplant persistent MRD you can manage with uh, maintenance with uh, hypomethylating agent? Uh, uh, certainly, um, there are uh, trials going on um, at the moment as we speak. Um, you can, if you don't have access, you can obviously consider a hypermethylating agents. That's one strategy, but you can also consider um, uh, withdrawing immunosuppression early. You can give um, DLI. There is a trend for rising MRD. Now, again, as I uh, pointed out in the presentation, one of the uh, important determinants of outcome is um, persistence of MRD, but also rising levels of MRD. That gives you the urgency. Now, you have to weigh the risks and benefits. So, as you know, DLI carries significant um, toxicity. So, you want to take that risk, um, uh, particularly if you are taking that early on, when you know that there is uh, an, an urgency. So, if there's a rising MRD level, you may want to do something more drastic. But if you can monitor, if you can give something more gentle, 
um, it would depend on scenario. Thank you very much, Seth. Another question. Um, in RIC, we generally start tapering immunosuppression earlier, um, that is around day 60. But in myeloablative conditioning, it's recommended that um, we should start around day 90 or 100 and taper it off over the next uh, month, 30 or 40 days. Do you recommend uh, tapering earlier in patients uh, who receive myeloablative conditioning but who had a uh, high level of MRD before? Yes, certainly. I mean, it is very um, individual uh, choice. So if the patient has very high risk disease, they had significant um, MRD level pre-transplant uh, and post-transplant, you're continuing to see high level of MRD, you will certainly want to uh, wean them off early. So this would be our uh, practice. Um, uh, certainly, you will have to be very careful um, when you withdrawing immunosuppression early, but uh, yes, this is something um, that is considered. We would consider that. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. So, so just to add a point regarding the early tapering of immunosuppression, so there was a study by uh, Dr. Charles Credick in which what he found that the only important, those who, are, who were taken to transplant in CR, the duration of cyclosporin exposure was the most important predictor of relapse in these patients. So those who had prolonged cyclosporin post-transplant. So he also actually recommended uh, the tapering in myeloablative as early as day 45 if there is no high risk uh, factors for GVHT and the patient is tolerating. Secondly, um, uh, just uh, uh, further refining this question regarding uh, how do we select uh, the therapeutic use or uh, the clinical application of MRD in real world. So just wanted to ask Dr. Saf that uh, we know that in uh, like in contrast to ALL where MRD is now a standard of care and therapeutic decisions are made on that. In AML there is still a lot of controversy going on and as you also rightly pointed out that especially DTA mutations patients with RUNX1, RUNX1, T1 so there's a lot of data to support that those who are MRD positive even they remained MRD positive for 8 to 10 years and they do not relapse. So whether do you uh, use specific MRD markers for your therapeutic decision in real world, like maybe NPM1, which is most, which has got most consistent data of relapse or you use all these MRD markers? Um, I think you're, you raise a very important point and you're absolutely right. I think um, we can't take all MRD markers we can't consider them to be of same importance. Um, this is an evolving area. Um, I think in terms of NPM um, related MRD monitoring, it is quite obvious now that uh, it is the data is most mature in this area. So we will, in our clinical practice, we will certainly react to um, MRD when we're monitoring it um, with NPM. Uh, mutation and we know at certain specific time points uh, when the NPM is positive then that's a that's a uh, bad sign and you will obviously want to change the risk um, category of that patient and you will adopt a different uh, management strategy um, when you have uh, other markers I think this is an evolving area and I would uh, exercise caution in terms of interpretation of um, those markers um, we still don't have a consensus on a standardized way of interpreting um, some of those um, uh, mutations that we use as a MRD marker. However, um, the data is becoming more mature, which indicates that if you have persistent MRD, you're likely to relapse. Now, um, even if you use, um, obviously DTA has become clear, but if you have DTA mutation, you just ignore them. But uh, some of the other markers which are not associated with CHIP, um, you may want to take them more uh, seriously. One um, important strategy that we sometimes follow, even when you're following MRD with NPM, um, for example, if the patient is NPM positive and FLIC3 negative, you know that these are relatively bad risk. If there is persistent NPM positivity, um, you would not immediately jump to, for example, transplanting these patients. Well, um, and that is why I pointed out that the uh, burden of MRD in those cases becomes important. So if you uh, following the patient and there is a rising trend in MRD, then you know that something is imminent and then you can change your uh, strategy. 
um, rest of the um, uh, markers that you use, I think for many of those, we would not know, but I would continue to monitor them. And as the things stand, I would be looking at a rising level in some of those cases, if the patient was otherwise deemed uh, standard risk uh, and uh, considered suitable just for um, observation. Thank you very much. And another uh, short question that what uh, for AML, what uh, method of MRD monitoring would you recommend? We know that for AML, there is no method which is standard. So in your uh, clinical practice, what you use actually, you use a combination of flow cytometry, MRD, PCR, or like, how do you actually uh, use it? Uh, so for us, uh, mostly so in recent um, um, couple of years, I've kind of, you know, in, in last year, I've had a privilege of working outside of the UK as well. So um, we were working on NGS based MRD monitoring uh, in my previous place of work. Before that, the standard that we were using was NPN based molecular MRD. Now, um, this is um, an interesting and important question, and you will see that there is uh, institutional variation um, and even national variation. Because, um, as I explained earlier, that multi-parameter flow cytometry, for example, requires a lot of expertise to be developed. Now, if you are in a center where there is um, no suitable person, or you've not developed or strengthened your um, uh, skills in a particular area, you may want to follow a um, slightly different path. But there are other centers in the world where multi-parameter flow cytometry is a very, very standard technique. So, I guess to answer your question, um, the modality that you will use will depend upon your resources and will depend upon your expertise. Uh, Doctor, uh, another point. Uh, we can also rely on a lineage-specific chimerism uh, with the low level of MRD positivity. Uh, we can monitor with uh, CD3 uh, uh, chimerism. And with folic CD3 chimerism, we can plan DLI uh, at what level of CD3 positivity you plan DLI for your patient? When I was in UK with Dr. Uh, Professor Charles Cred, uh, uh, CD38 less than 98%. We plan. Uh, we used to plan DLI. Yes. Yeah, so um, there is a kind of slight difference here. But we need to be um, mindful of. Uh, so persistence of chimerism obviously does not always mean that there is a significant disease burden in the background because you can have um, recipient chimerism in the absence of recipient leukemia however um, obviously if you have undertaken uh, if you have taken the patient through um, allergenic stem cell transplant that means to you know to me means that you've already deemed that patient at a high risk of relapse so you don't want them to have a mixed donor chimerism so in terms of um, um, uh, unfractionated um, whole blood you you know anything below 95 percent is not really acceptable so you may want to intervene early uh, with regards to cd3 um, it depends on how soon after for example cd3 or myeloid compartment monocytic compartment um, if you are doing the um, uh, the chimerism analysis, I would say that there is no consensus. And recently, um, if you look at uh, the strategy that uh, United Kingdom was following, um, there is a clinical trial that was introduced called ProDLI, uh, where you were preemptively giving um, uh, DLI, and it transpired that different centers, and even in the United Kingdom, were using different um, uh, threshold. Now we would adopt in my previous practice uh, a very individualized approach when it came to cd3 uh, mixed chimerism so presumably that's what your question is so as i said whole blood is relatively easy to answer now for example if you are continuing to see in a very high risk patient a significant level of cd3 um, uh, recipient don't uh, recipient chimerism which is continuing to increase and particularly if you use a myeloablative regime where you don't expect to see that then you may want to intervene relatively early. Whereas, as you know, in um, uh, reduced intensity conditioning transplants, you can sometimes continue to see this, which improves over time. And um, there is not kind of enough data at the moment, I would say, um, that CD3 has been conclusively proven 
um, to be associated with a impending risk of relapse. So depending upon the uh, stage and the type of conditioning that you've used, you would want to. Like I will start worrying very early on for myeloablative transplant if there's a persistent recipient thymosin on both. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. I think it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. So, so another question, Dr. Saif. So, you are the only one available with us. So, we are bombarding you with different questions. But obviously, um, your input is very, very important for us. So, um, for those patients who have got MRD positivity post-transplant, are there any trials going on or do you use any maintenance therapy? Um, we know that maintenance therapy is not a standard, but are there any clinical trials going on for those who are post-transplant MRD positive acute myeloid leukemia patients? Uh, that, that, that's right. So we ha we have clinical trials. We are looking at hypomethylating agents after um, uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Now the slight difficulty here is that, um, as you know, after allogeneic transplant, the recovery of cells is not always um, uh, optimum. So how do you use? When do you start it? How long can you continue? The toxicity is high. So that is why less toxic regimes such as oral azacitidine is being trialed, uh, hypomethylating agents and so on and so forth. But remember, if you have a targetable um, mutation, then you can preemptively use that after the transplant and you can use it regardless of whether the patient has mixed spamerism or regardless of whether the patient has uh, MRD. So in other words, you don't have to wait for MRD to appear and keep rising if you have a targetable mutation. So I think um, this will become more important once we have more uh, targeted treatments readily uh, available. But yes, you're right. There are uh, some strategies, even in those patients where there is no targetable mutation, um, hypomethylating agents are being trialed. And um, are you using BCL2 uh, mutation testing, BCL1 and 2 as a routine practice to include Vinitoclax uh, for them? And do you consider that BCL2 mutations are actionable mutations uh, currently with ongoing data and evidence we have got? Yes, so I think at the moment the practice hasn't changed because as you know, with the COVID, uh, things are pretty tricky. Um, your, your hands are tied, but uh, and these developments have happened relatively recently. So I think that there will clearly be, um, um, you know, if you look at the uh, suggestions at the national level, there will clearly be risk adopted and um, uh, targeted uh, uh, therapeutic strategies that will be uh, implemented across. Um, I think um, many centers in the world are already doing it. Um, but um, I would agree with you that um, this is a way forward. Uh, whether it's been incorporated into the clinical practice or not, I think because of the recent events, um, you know, you don't really have much choice, but you have to adopt to the treatment, um, not based on one factor, but multiple factors. Um, but um, I would be in favor of um, uh, what you have just uh, described. So I think we need to uh, change our um, uh, strategy. I think there was an interesting debate on um, UKMRC forum as to whether DA should ever be used now um, as an upfront treatment. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the outcome of the uh, you know the consensus from the group was that no, <laughs> it doesn't have a role as a single you know uh, modality of treatment that we use to use. So it has to be used in the context of what. Um, refined um, uh, risk uh, category the patient is in and what other mutations the patient has. So you add in uh, other agents. So, you know, the, the, the landscape of AML is changing clearly based on these mutations. So do you think, Dr. Saab, uh, sorry, um, we, we are asking too many questions. Uh, it's okay. Last question, okay. you think that, uh, um, uh, depending upon the patient age, risk stratification, uh, pre-transplant MRD level and post-transplant MRD level and uh, behavior of the patient during conditioning and post-transplant, uh, we can modify our strategy uh, regarding immunosuppression tapering, uh, post-transplant uh, maintenance with hypomethylating agent 
or um, a DLI? Uh, can we do it on case to case basis? And uh, do you think that we require any solid recommendations uh, to adapt any strategy post transplant? Uh, uh, certainly. I think uh, this is something that we've been doing for a little while, but unfortunately, we've been doing it, <clears throat> I think, in my view, a little bit too late. Like. You know that a significant proportion of patients will relapse after um, allergen uh, stem cell transplantation. So um, we we had um, institutional data when we used uh, azacitidine in those patients who were showing early relapse or who had morphological relapse, <clears throat> even though we did not have any reliable MRD markers in those patients. And um, we had reasonable outcome. We had one or two patients who even have long-term survival after a floated um, early uh, 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 relapse of disease. So that shows that there are, there are patients that you can salvage and obviously um, what um, Dr. Hill was saying as well, you know, um, you can adopt this strategy of early intervention in these patients. Um, I would say that with, if I had MRD um, available for every single patient, obviously we also don't have access to free access to multiparameter flow cytometry, which will uh, cover a majority of cases of AML uh, in a way you are restricted um, uh, in terms of your MRD assessment to a smaller proportion of patients where you have molecular targets. So if I was able to monitor it in, a, uh, in more patients, I would certainly like to intervene early post allogenic transplantation uh, because uh, particularly if there is a rising trend, particularly if there is a worrying trend, um, I will go even a step further and I would say that um, um, you can uh, adopt a strategy where you, the patients who are very high risk of relapse, uh, you need to intervene early. For example, if there is a flit tree patient, this will become a stand. This is a standard practice these days to give them flit tree inhibitors, even if they're not kind of relapsed. So um, I would say that if there is, for example, significant dysplasia in the patients, um, you may want to consider using um, uh, hypermethylating agent relatively early because uh, even with hypermethylate, you know, obviously, as you know, once the relapse has happened, you, you, you've missed the boat. So if you could do something early, I think it, um, obviously, it is to be proven yet um, in prospective studies, but it should work because we have seen, all of us have seen an anecdotal uh, evidence where we have withdrawn immunosuppression, uh, we've given azacitidine or hypermethylating agent, patient has got some GVHD, and we all have those long-term survivors in these groups. So if you could bring that a little bit early when the relapse hasn't happened yet, then uh, clearly you should be able to modify the disease course. Um, Thank you. And Dr. Saif, uh, we were, before you joined in, we were discussing uh, with Dr. Nigat as well regarding uh, the indications of transplant for a uh, country like Pakistan where MRD facilities are not available in more than two to three big centers of the country. And um, we know that uh, if we do not do MRD, uh, most of the site patients, um, so uh, AML gene panel is not available, NGS is virtually not available for any of the AML patient. MRD by flow cytometry is available in one to two centers. So um, you know that there was a Swiss trial as well who actually consolidated their favorable patients with autologous transplant and the five-year survival was around 85 to 90 percent. And the intermediate risk uh, cases are now transplanted in most of the centers across the globe. So in a country like Pakistan where we do not have MRD, uh, what do you suggest where we should be placing our transplant? Um, um, Rahil, I think I lost you for a few moments, so I apologize if I misunderstood your question. Um, but uh, I think what, what you're asking is um, uh, what, where should the allergenic transplant fall in terms of the management category of uh, patients? Um, uh, you know, in, in acute myeloid leukemia. In Pakistan. Uh, in you, a, you probably know. Yes, in a, country like Pakistan, in, Pakistan. in a country like Pakistan, where we do not have yeah. MRD facilities yeah. established. So I personally think, yes. think that we need to relook at the indications of transplant. So maybe we should yes. transplant uh, more patients. Um, um, Rahil, I uh, completely agree with you. And I have uh, made my 
uh, views very clear on that to every transplant consultant in Pakistan that I've spoken to. And um, again, it's not based on any clinical evidence because you would not have much clinical evidence. But I think the, the key the key part of transplanting a patient is to look at the risks and benefits of an intervention. And you have to go back to that very basic principle. Now, in my experience of kind of guiding some patients for treatment in a country like Pakistan, I feel that the outcome of a second relapse in Pakistan is extremely bleak. Now, I haven't come across uh, any uh, you know major study, and I apologize if I've missed one. But I have not anecdotally seen literally any person kind of, you know, surviving after CR2, unless obviously they've gone on to have a transplant. So in my view, if your outcome is so poor after, um, after the relapse, you must do everything and anything that you can in the first remission. And also, I think it also, um, you know, coming from the same part of the world, I know that there is this thing in our psyche as well, that the longer the treatment, our patients tend to give up relatively early. So if you they, they had a long cycle of treatment, you left the treatment, a few months or a year later they've relapsed, now it will become very difficult to convince them and the broader family to take all that long treatment and have a second transplant where it will be absolutely mandated. So in my view, I think an early transplant uh, for acute myeloid leukemia uh, should be considered and um, I know I'm a transplant physician, so my views can be a little bit skewed here as well. But I think that if you have any worry about the disease, you know, obviously you don't want to transplant good risk acute leukemias, but um, if you have good donors, patients are relatively well, uh, I would be inclined to do transplants early. And I think hopefully you will also agree with that. I, I, I would not want to take the patients through uh, through to the same, you know, um, second um, cycles of uh, rung of second cycles of treat, you know, uh, second rung of treatment, and then allogeneic transplant. That would be too much in a country like Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor Saf. Thank you very much, Doctor Nigat. It was indeed um, an excellent session, very informative. I thank you all, uh, the speakers and panelists for sparing their precious time for us. Thank you very much. Thank you.